While he was incredibly low on chakra from the ceiling, Daiki thankfully had a backup plan that could work as a tip me up. The clone he had created to switch with him in case things went south, by dispelling it, he regained a full half of his total chakra capacity. Ah, that's better. He groaned in relief. He just sat there for a moment, before erupting into stunned laughter. This was insane, he couldn't believe it had actually all worked out for him. Sure, he'd hyped himself up and told himself it would all work out. But, there was that prickle of doubt that ate away at his thoughts at the back of his mind. And odd as it was, even though he just sealed the sandy himself into his chest, Daiki didn't really feel anything different. Like, since it was completely new to him, he could feel the connection between himself, his chakra and the contents of within the seal on his chest, but beyond that, he didn't really well, feel all that different. Actually, wait. As he focused on his chakra, he noticed. It felt, a bit different, in a way he couldn't really describe. Not stronger in any way. Dot and, hum. It's regenerating quicker already, he realized with a start as he focused on it. That was good, really good actually. He hadn't really had a frame of reference beyond Obito and Madara becoming Jinchuriki to guess on how long it would be before the benefits package of being a Jinchuriki showed up. It would usually take longer than this actually, the voice of Isogu suddenly echoed in his mind, making Daiki jump with a yelp. I'm used to this now though, so I know how it works, I'm just actively helping you. Oh, well that made sense he supposed. Thanks, he thought back, focusing on the seal. Don't mention it, I'm just doing as I agreed. Isobu replied, I have to admit, it's a lot more roomy in here than the last few I was in, this is good work. Though, we really need to work on your chakra capacity, it's quite shallow isn't it? Ouch, his pride. He'd actually been particularly proud of reaching the chakra levels of a janin. Well, either way, he wouldn't be long in increasing his chakra capacity massively. Not only because of Biju, but also because of the eyes he planned on getting his hands on, or, rather, his eye sockets on, in, holding. Moving on. Not only would Isobu be making his chakra capacity grow, the constant drain from the eyes, would basically amount to constantly using his chakra at least a little bit, which would immediately be topped up by Isobu regenerating his chakra at a much faster rate. Between the two of them alone, his chakra capacity would increase massively, rapidly. And that was without actually factoring in his training, which would be massively increased due to again, the presence of Isobu. I see, these eyes do indeed look useful for more even than just their innate abilities. Isobu chimed in, it seems you have everything planned out on how to get stronger, well, beyond finding training material, pure physical might only go so far, as you can probably tell by my siblings and I. Huh, he hadn't explained them yet to Isobu. Can you see my memories? He asked, interested and at the same time not sure what kind of reaction he'd have to the fact that he was a fusion of two people, one from another world entirely. Yes, I can see your memories, quite easily, you kept much of this seal open, remember? You designed it after all. You have given me full access. Isobu replied, as for this other world business, trust me when I say, I have seen much weirder. I have even been to hell once. Oh yeah, hell did exist in this place didn't it? The sound Ford tried to drag in Shikamaru, Choji, Kiba and Neji with them if he remembered right during one of the anime arcs, right? And there were actual demons from hell from the movies. Like the one with that hot priestess that wanted Naruto's kid. That did bring up a question. What the hell even were the Rashomon summons? Hashirama could summon them. As could Orochimaru and one of the sound four. The one with the faggy lipstick. They're creatures from hell actually. Isobu helpfully supplied. They escaped some time in the past. Quite annoying fellows. I believe the Uzumaki clan dealt with them by sealing them into doors. Huh, interesting. Also amusing that Hashirama Senju literally had a contract with what amounted to doors possessed by demons. Also, funny, the Uzumaki clan just didn't give a shit man. Isobu snorted. Resisting the urge to laugh in amusement, Daiki changed the subject. So you've got a look at my plans then? He asked. Yes, Raiga Kurosaki and this Rinmara boy, Isobu hummed, they shouldn't be a problem. Well, that was good to know, really good to know. He more was thinking about the fact that he was going to be killing a child and taking his eyes to get stronger. He'd long since come to terms with the fact that he would be doing it and comforted himself with the fact that Rinmara may have pulled a heel face turn in the end, but he in the beginning, was all too happy to help Raiga murder innocents. You are a child as well, you understand, Isobu pointed out, killing is killing in the end, no matter the age of the victim. 
and I have killed much younger children before. Just a hundred years ago, children not even half this boy's age were fighting on the battlefield, killing, looting, scores of youngster humans have attacked me, I killed them all the same. Daiki nodded, he quite agreed actually. He said nothing more and let the topic drop with that. He moved on, right, then will it be alright to try out using your chakra right now then? He asked, I want to get a feel for it. That should be fine, I've got a feel for the signature of your chakra to match mine did, Isobu agreed. A second later, he felt a massive surge of chakra spread out from the seal into his chakra coils, and his vision was tinted red as thick, tangible chakra began to bubble out of his tenketsu forming into a roiling cloak, a single thick and heavy shrimp-like tail forming behind him. Strength suffused Daiki, almost the same way it had when he drank the hero water. This, this isn't bad at all. Daiki grinned clenched and unclenching his hands, watching the chakra bubble around him. And it was just so easy to control. It moved according to his thoughts, as if it were another limb he'd just gained. He looked over his shoulder and his grin widened as he wiggled the thick energy tail he'd gained back and forth. He didn't feel quite as strong as he did when he had taken the hero water, but he was a hell a lot stronger right now than he was in his normal base form. As soon as he thought that, he felt even more chakra exude from the seal on his chest, and he felt as his power spiked massively. Two more thick shrimp-like tails bubbled into existence, forming on his back, holy shit. Daiki gaped at himself feeling how strong he'd become from this. Insane, how insane. His strength now felt like it put his power with the hero water to shame. Yeah, with this, I'm sure I can deal with Raiga. Daiki laughed. He punched out his arm, trying something out, and watched with glee as the chakra around his arm extended outwards into a gargantuan red chakra claw that stretched for hundreds of feet in the blink of an eye. The claw so large it could grasp a bus within its palm and crush it in a blink. If this was how powerful he felt with just the basic chakra cloak, he wondered exactly how powerful he'd be assuming the version 2 chakra cloak, or even, how strong he'd be going full biju mode in assuming Isobu's form. I really want to fire off a biju dama, he thought excitedly. As soon as he did, the chakra flow was cut off and he felt himself weaken drastically to his weak base self. He instantly missed the feeling of unstoppable strength he felt before. Calm down, don't go getting a power high from just that much, Isobu huffed. Besides, if you fire off a Bijudama you'll alert anyone within a thousand miles of what's happening and your plans will be ruined. Remember? The giant turtle helpfully reminded him. Oh yeah, he didn't want anybody knowing about his new status as a Jinchuriki, it was supposed to be a secret after all. I had to finish this mission already and get back to the grind. Daiki bit his lip. He wanted to feel that power, without doping on something like the hero water or borrowing someone else's power. Besides, if Isobu's full power alone was enough to handle all of his problems, they wouldn't be in the situation they currently were. He had to remind himself, Isobu was his ally, not a crutch. You really are a weird kid, Isobu laughed lightly, don't worry, you'll have plenty to work on, I'll coach you on how to use my abilities beyond just my chakra, like my coral style. And if you really want to cut loose that badly, you can always use my space-time ninjutsu and hide out in my dimension and go wild once you have it down as well. Ah, Isobu was the best biju, screw Kurama, Naruto could keep that testy fox. Isobu chuckled again, Kurama isn't that bad, sometimes, while well he lightens up apparently to this Naruto kid. The turtle biju tried and failed to defend his brother. Well, not that Daiki was saying Kurama wasn't cool. He was an utter badass, no doubt about that. Isobu was just better, turtle power over fox power all the way. Isobu's amusement was palpable, but he said nothing else on the subject. Probably to be chill and respect his brother. Putting that out of mind for the moment, Daiki felt fully topped up now after having a hit of Isobu's chakra. It was about time to get a move on and head for the Katabami gold mine and get those eyes and sparky sparky swords. First though, he wanted to check out his status, so he called it up. The fuck, he stopped and stared. That wasn't right, dot and that didn't make sense? Name. Daiki Yure. Age. 13. Chakra capacity. 49,500 49,500s, Jonin. Strength. 110. Endurance. 160. Durability. 110. Agility. 110. Taijutsu. 175 500s, Ninjutsu, 195 500s, Genjutsu, 10 500s, Bukajutsu, 
75 500 chakra control 196 500 chakra affinities lightning adept you have stepped onto the path of roaring thunder water novice you have no training with this element fuinjutsu journeyman the world breathes his stat caps at least for his physical abilities had all turned into question marks how the hell did that make sense so this is the game system you can see, interesting, I cannot see it through your eyes, but only through your memories as they register, how peculiar, Isobu spoke, interest in his voice, it seems you have inherited my water affinity as my Jinchuriki as expected. As for the new changes, perhaps this system of yours cannot determine a physical limit for you? That made sense he supposed, but anything he'd seen like this before, was usually from some incredibly powerful entity, how could it not measure his limit? Maybe this system isn't as special as you think it is? Isobu supplied. From my point of view, it hasn't really given you anything beyond a screen to see your progress as you trained. Beyond motivation and fusing your souls together, it seems to provide no other benefits. Once again, he wasn't wrong. Then just what the hell was this thing in the end? Perhaps some form of bloodline mutation? Isobu mused. Bloodlines interacting with the subconscious aren't unheard of nor ones interacting with space-time and dimensions either. I've seen all manner of bloodlines over my lifetime, this would hardly be a groundbreaking one. Huh, when he put it like that. The thing about Isobu's abilities, was that they were natural and innate to him. Almost like a bloodline limit to perfectly honest. Using them was incredibly simple, as long as he had access to Isobu's chakra. Of course, it helped a lot, that Isobu was very willing to show him how to use it. As in, their minds were utterly linked and they could switch position on who was in control and who wasn't. So learning how to use Isobu's abilities, was as simple as giving him free control over his body for a brief time and having the Biju use his abilities through Daiki's body and showing him how it was done. He almost felt like an Uchiha for a brief time with how easily he picked up a bunch of new jutsu just by literally having a big old turtle use said jutsu through him and copying how it was done. It was a bit weird to find himself standing a massive dimly lit void beside Isobu's huge body, the only light being a small lake of chakra that Isobu claimed was Daiki's own. And then griped about it being too shallow for him to submerge his body in and swim around in. Daiki vowed to have a chakra capacity so large in the future that even Naruto would weep in envy. The only downside to all this I suppose, is if I ever lose you, I'll lose access to your abilities as well. Daiki mused perched over the top of a cliffside, overlooking a small mining village. It had only taken him a few hours to get here, and he barely felt winded at all. Actually, he felt full of energy. Jinchuriki's stamina was great, and he'd only gotten the very beginnings of it. Even as he ran his way over, he could feel his isobu fed his chakra into Daiki's own and force it to grow bit by bit. It wasn't expanding massively, only increasing by what amounted to a fraction of a fraction of the total amount he actually had but, it was a constant thing and it piled up. You'll have much worse things to worry about than losing just my abilities if that happens. Isobu deadpanned, like being dead for one. Maybe, Daiki nodded, though that just meant he had failed in the great grind that was his life, but, I think if I grab a piece of the stone of Gelel, I could survive it. He granted so much longevity one could appear almost immortal, after all, a little mundane ferret that had eaten a small piece had been alive for multiple hundreds of years. That kind of longevity would even put Kashinas to shame, and she would have survived the extraction of Kurama if she had gotten treatment quickly, or you know, not got gored through the stomach by one of the literal mountain-sized biju's claws. Speaking of Kurama though, hey, can I like eat some of you? Daiki asked. That's what those gold and silver guys from Kumo did to your brother and they got to keep a bunch of his chakra despite not even being Jinchuriki. If they could do it, why not him? What? No, Isobu outright sputtered. Losing his composure utterly, what is wrong with you Daiki? Do you like power that much? Just make a separate seal with my chakra in it, I'm not letting you devour my flesh just so you can keep my abilities you weirdo. Well, it wasn't like Isobu couldn't regenerate it, so what was the harm? You've gotten a healing factor yourself now, why not let some tiny creature chew on your insides then get back to me, Isobu deadpanned. I'm good. Daiki decided to drop the issue. Well. Those gold and silver brothers were lame anyway with their obsession with gold and silver medals. He supposed he could just copy what was done to that Sora kid in that one filler arc who had a bunch of Kurama's chakras sealed in him. Yes, you do that. Isobu agreed. 
Oh well, it was just a thought. The grind never waited and never ended. And he had plenty more to work on once he got back to Konoha as well. A whole slew of water ninjutsu to go about learning. Courtesy of Isobu. Or well, rather, Yagura. It was too bad that he couldn't just use the jutsu himself through Daiki's body like with his own innate abilities, but E.H., not everyone was perfect, not even a super kaiju turtle. I've never had to use hand seals before, he could see Isobu shrug in his mind's eyes, nor have I got any training in actual ninjutsu. I can show you the jutsu he used, the hand seals for them and how he trained, but you'll have to puzzle out the rest yourself. And that was perfectly okay with Daiki. He was already feeling yucky deep in his balls that he was getting so much without having to go through the grind. Being able to suddenly use all the jutsu of a real proper cage, would be just far too convenient. Also, the grind had been kind to him. Your love of training aside, Isobu spoke dryly. Perhaps get your head in the game? It's about time to jump into action is it not? Indeed, he was perched atop a cliffside, a few hundred feet above the mining area of the town, specifically perched directly above a large building that probably once belonged to the leader of this settlement before Raiga came in, killed him and took over. He knew it was where his targets were, because of all the thugs dressed in black cloaks guarding the perimeter. They probably already know I'm here, Daiki mused. If the boy Rinmara isn't asleep, then yes, they're probably waiting to see what kind of move you make before retaliating. Isobu agreed. The smart move, with an enemy all clustered together like that, would be to bombard them with ninjutsu. The problem was, while he was sure he could do that and kill Raiga if he wasn't fast enough with Isobu's power, that left the risk of damaging Rinmara's eyes. Honestly, the only threat was Raiga himself, the thugs he'd recruited were all civilians he forced to work for him and trained himself. Training by a powerful Jonin or not, shinobi training wasn't that simple that one could reach what it took to be even a genin without building a proper foundation first, and unless your name was Itachi Uchiha or Kakashi Hitaki, that foundation took years to build. They wouldn't be an issue to get through, so attacking head-on was his best bet. Go for the kill instantly, Isobu told him, I do not remember much of Raiga personally, but I do remember the Kiba blades. They are incredibly powerful and will pierce even through my chakra. As soon as he said so, Daiki felt the familiar feeling of raw, unadulterated power surge in his veins. Thick red bubbles of chakra oozing out of his tenketsu and forming a cloak around him, three tails immediately forming behind him. As soon as the three tailed, version 1 chakra cloak formed over him. Daiki moved, erupting down with a shunshin propelling his enhanced speed to even crazier degrees. The cliffside he was perched atop shattered completely from the sheer force and speed of his takeoff, and the world blurred around him. He slammed into and through the room of the building, tearing its foundations apart and the impact of his landing shaking the earth beneath him like a rumbling earthquake. In but a split few seconds, the large building had been turned into a pile of debris. Daiki heard many a scream of shock and fear, but ignored them, his brown eyes, replaced with the eyes of Isobu, a demonic-looking glare, a yellow-ringed iris, on a purple-ringed backdrop, whipped around back and forth, looking for his target. A moment later, a pile of the debris shattered apart and a large, tan man with long greasy black hair erupted into the air, landing on the side of the cliff above him, glaring down, over his shoulder, there was black bag, almost like a cocoon in shape and looks. So it was a Jin Chiriki, the man spat as he eyed Daiki, levying a pair of slim, double-edged blades, each with an upward curved bladed prong, akin to a monstrous fang near the tip of one side of the blade and another one near the base of the blade's other side, and would you look at that? Those are some familiar eyes. Have you been sent to hunt me down for the misty baby demon? Daiki didn't bother answer, he focused on his back for a moment, piercing his three tails into the ground behind him, before thrusting both hands out firing out a pair of massive chakra claws through the air towards the man. As if, the man laughed, his twin blades erupting into incredibly powerful and bright crackling electricity and slashed it with both blades. From the blades, erupted a pair of huge slashes of lightning that cut straight through the chakra claws, before leaping after them with a shunshin towards Daiki. Damn, Isobu wasn't kidding, he was already prepared for this though. From his still raised hands, Daiki fired a pair of force palm jutsus, the pair of shockwaves that tore through the fangs of lightning approaching him. Then erupted up in a blur of speed. Raiga was fast no doubt, he couldn't compare to his own speed backed by his current form. His fist found purchase in Raiga's stomach a second later, and the man gagged, 
eyes widening in pain as he contorted around his fist from the force of the blow, before a moment later, shooting back through the air from the direction he came from. Raiga, a young, boyish voice cried in terror from the bag on Raiga's shoulder. A red mist shimmered around Daiki, nearly instantly hiding his opponent from him. To bad he expected this as well. The mountainside was pulled apart, his three chakrad tails erupting from the side of it, exactly where Raiga had been standing before. And the former member of the seven ninja swordsmen was quickly snatched up by two of his tails, while the third one grabbed the bag and ripped it from Raiga's shoulders, wrapping around the bag up to halfway. Then he squeezed with all the tails, all of them. Bone crunched under the sheer force exerted by the Sanbi's chakrad tails, and he crushed everything below the head on the pair of them. See, Raiga was strong, stronger than Daiki no doubt, but he relied on a crutch to be relevant at all. As amazing as the Kiba blades were though, they just couldn't compare to a biju. We both have crutches, mine is just better, Daiki mused, reeling his tails back to him, and holding the crushed corpses in the air in front of him. Daiki eyed them for a moment, before focusing, Sunpo, he thought, focusing Isobu's chakra. His body shimmered with shadows of black and salmon pink, before suddenly, he was no longer standing in the middle of the Katabami gold mine, and instead, found himself standing atop a huge marble pillar, with an inky black void sky. Well, he thought pillar, but really, it was a single massive landmass that stretched on and on and on for miles in every direction. It eerily reminded him of Obito's Kamui dimension, but slightly different. Sunpo, it meant dimension. It was the name of Isobu's space-time ability. It's slightly like Kamui. But only in the sense that it transported the user to this personal dimension of Isobu's. When he used it again to leave, it would transport him to the exact same place he was in before he entered the dimension. It wouldn't let him teleport around everywhere and it definitely wouldn't let him do something as bullshit as keeping separate parts of his body in the dimension so he could like be intangible and troll the shit out of everyone like Obito did. If only though, that would be amazingly funny. He banished that thought immediately, this wasn't exactly an amusing moment. With the corpses in the grip of his tails, Daiki lowered them gently to the ground, before allowing Isobu's chakra to dissipate and returning to normal. His eyes settled on the black bag, he could see a massive amount of blood seeping through it. Grimacing, Daiki looked away from it and at the pulp body of Raiga. It was a mess, the only thing properly intact, being his head, his features twisted into agonizing pain, that he probably felt for all the split second before he died. A split second meant a hell of a lot more to a shinobi than it did to a civilian though. Daiki walked over to the corpse of the former mist shinobi, and picked up the pair of blades stuck in what was one the mont's hands, now chunks of pulp meat. It was disgusting, but he pilfered the blades from the corpse, before instantly bringing one down and severing the head from the corpse and sealing it away in his dimension force seal. That done, Daiki ignored the corpses and focuses on the blades in his hands, lightly running his chakra through them, not even trying to turn his chakra into lightning. As soon as he did, sparks buzzed into existence before cladding it in a small crackling aura of lightning, easily on par with, if not stronger than his own chakra flow technique using his lightning. That's fucking insane. Daiki gaped. The swords themselves automatically transformed even normal chakra into lightning chakra. Just holding these could let any random scrub that could use chakra, create lightning chakra on par with an expert in lightning elemental manipulation. Curious, he changed the flow of chakra he was channeling into it, into lightning chakra itself and watched as the aura crackling around the swords ballooned in size massively. Yet, did not spark out of his control at all. It was so damn easy to control his lightning like this. It seemed, not only did these blades amplify the power his lightning chakra, it also made it much easier to use and control. Yeah, it was no wonder these things were so highly regarded. If the other blades could at all compare to these and he knew Samahata at least could and was better, then he could definitely understand Suigetsu's desire to collect them all. His examining done, Daiki cut off the flow of chakra to the blades, letting the aura of lightning around them fizzle out and then sealed them in his palms. Now to deal with you, he swallowed, turning to the black bag laying in the middle of a puddle of blood. He walked over to the bag and crouched over the head of it, hesitating for a brief moment, before grasping the zipper at the top and bringing it down. The face of a small boy, maybe around nine years old stared back at him, pale, aristocratic features, medium-length purple hair, and bright red eyes open wide in surprise. 
There was a reason he specifically aimed to kill Rinmara while he was still in that bag, so he couldn't see the boy's face and hesitate. The boy probably didn't even feel any pain before he died, just had enough time to be confused and not register it, before his heart, organs and everything else below his neck was destroyed. Sorry kid, no hard feelings. Daiki sighed, before holding his hand out and summoning a glass jar, placing it down beside him. It was empty, except for a light green fluid filling it up to near the brim. It was a special kind of liquid produced by the shinobi in the hospital, made with chakra and helped to keep cut off limbs and other body parts fresh and revitalized. He didn't know after all, if his body would end up rejecting them. He doubted it, with how easy eyes got swapped about in this world, but it was always best to make sure, so he could swap his own eyes back in. He unscrewed the top of the jar, before breathing deeply and bringing his hands into a modified ox hand seal. Green chakra suffused his hands, before he brought one hand up and peeled his right eyelid completely open. Then placed two fingers of the other over his wide eye. He let the chakra seep in, examining his nerves and everything about his eye and the socket, numbing the pain receptors as best he could. Then he grit his teeth and pushed on, digging his two fingers into his eye socket and plucking. How do your eyes feel? Isobu asked. A full half an hour had passed since he'd finished. It was, actually a lot easier than he thought it was going to be. Though, that was partly due to Isobu's chakra than his own efforts. All he'd had to do was connect the nerves in his eye socket, and within minutes he was done. When you've been around as long as I have, it's simple to get a template of your body using my chakra, Isobu input, so, he prompted. Ichi. Daiki answered simply. He couldn't tell if that was because if the nerves were still a bit tender, or because of his new visual prowess. Even without trying to activate any of the abilities of his new eyes, his vision was still massively enhanced. Before, he had 20-20 vision, his eyes were pretty damn good already, and could see most things clearly for a good 40-50 feet before they started getting blurry at all. Now, if he focused, he could clearly see things and focus his vision on them, and see them as if he were standing right next to them, from hundreds of feet away, and the sheer scope of his vision, which had topped out before at a few miles as was normal for human eyes, could see over 10 miles away. He'd check with a clone. That'll fade I'm sure, from what I can feel of your chakra, there is no signs of rejection. Isobu mused, now you just need to figure out how these abilities work. He didn't really have time to work on that himself, he had things to do after all, he still had a mission to complete. Thankfully, he had access to this handy dandy little dimension and he could just leave a bunch of clones here to work on the abilities together and pass on the information to him by dispelling while he made his way to the village of artisans. About the clones, you realize you could have had one of them do the procedure, correct? Isobu asked. Yes, yes he did. He hadn't been thinking when he started though. He just wanted to get the eyes out and in his sockets, so he didn't have to look at the kid he murdered for his eyes any longer. Stupid of him, but already done and he couldn't change that. Also, you could have let me know, he pointed out. I didn't want to startle you when you were plucking your eyes, Isobu retorted. How annoying, why did he have to be so logical? It comes with thinking about things other than the grind, Isobu chuckled. As far as the eyes went, there was a constant drain from them now that they were connected to his chakra network and he couldn't deactivate their base passive form. But, it was honestly a minuscule amount and stopped whenever he shut his eyes and cut off his vision from seeing anything. Which he didn't even need to do because of Isobu, because his chakra regenerated far faster than the eyes drained. Their only passive power without focusing any more chakra into his eyes was enhanced vision, unlike the Sharingan that when active in the base, non-mangeku forms, had all abilities passively activated at once, which was probably why it was such a major chakra drain on Kakashi. It's a good thing, like you thought it would be. With my chakra mixing with yours and a constant strain, your paltry chakra capacity will indeed grow passively and quickly, Isobu hummed. Give it a few months and I may even be able to submerge myself in your chakra in here and go for a relaxing swim. Paltry. Again with the small chakra capacity jokes. No, it has nothing to do with your genitalia, I'm being literal, Isobu deadpanned. It still hurt his pride though. Shaking his head, Daiki pushed himself up from where he was resting on the marble ground and stood up. It was about time to get a move on. His eyes drifted over to the corpses of Raiga and Rinmara, before he slowly ran through a few hand seals and inhaled, before exhaling out a white hot sphere of flame that enveloped both bodies. Ryaga's head was one thing, 
he could just turn it in at any bounty station before going back to Konoha. Rinmara on the other hand, while it was possible his genes could have been put to use by the village, there was also the fact that Yamanaka could even read the lingering memories of the dead from their corpses. He didn't want to even leave a hint of a possibility of anyone finding out what he was up to. And there was a good chance a Yamanaka would be forced to mind walk the corpse just to see if there was any information the kid had about his bloodline or a clan. Better safe than sorry. Ignoring the smell of burning flesh, Daiki brought his hands together in a familiar hand seal. A moment later, there was a series of puffs of smoke and five identical clones of him appeared. You know what to do? he asked. In response, his own identical copies crossed their arms and gave him five smirks. We grind, what else? the one in the center retorted. There could be no other answer. Nodding, Daiki called upon Isobu's chakra and focused, Sunpo. He thought, shadows of black and green warping over his form and he found himself standing once again in the ruins of a large building within the Katabami Gold 9. There was a bunch of people out and about, but before they even realized he was there, Daiki disappeared in a blur of speed. The village of artisans, thankfully wasn't very far from the Katabami Gold Mine, it was directly north actually, and was only a day's walk away, but running there at a steady pace, only took a few hours. It was actually near the northern border of the land of rivers, which lead into the land of rain. Spooky to think he was so close to the Akatsuki headquarters, maybe I should see if I can find their little cave safe house here in the land of rivers while I'm here, Daiki mused. That could come in handy later. It seemed the most likely place any Jinchuriki caught in the land of fire or land of wind would be taken to at least and it actually wasn't that far from the waterfall village either, a direct line, so it was probably where Fu got sealed in the other timeline as well. He put that out of mind for the most, he was currently at his destination, taking a stroll through the village towards the main square, where a helpful nice lady running a stall told him, the leader of the village's residence and main office was located. Besides, it had been a fruitful few hours. His clones had put in a lot of work, with the help and advice of Isobu, and his chakra making sure they constantly had enough to train as they pleased. He had gotten a handle on the abilities of his new eyes. Granted, it was made much easier by the fact he knew exactly what they could do and only had to puzzle out how to activate them, but still. Gotta admit though, this place is amazing. Daiki mused, head going from side to side as he walked through the village, idly taking in all the shops and stalls he could see. It really was a village of artisans, Everywhere he went he could see stores selling paintings, stalls selling elaborate pottery, tons of weapon shops and he'd counted dozens of smithies. It was a place entirely dedicated to the trade, he could respect the grind set. It wasn't long later that Daiki arrived at the village leader's main residence and entered. He was directed to a large office area, with a small waiting room outside, a secretary waiting behind a small desk. Hello, may I help you? She asked, a slender, rather petite and short, pretty lady looking to be in her mid-twenties with brown bob-cut hair, light brown eyes and a kind smile. Hey, I'm from the Leaf Village. Daiki greeted her with a friendly smile of his own, I've got a delivery for your leader. Ah, I see, she nodded in understanding, the fire alignment or. If you'd like to take a seat and wait, I'll let Tomio-sama know you're here once he's done speaking to his current visitor. Just as she finished, he heard a loud bang come from within the office, followed by a shout, when will you see sense you old fool? This is our sacred duty, a man shouted angrily. The secretary winced, giving him a shaky smile and not commenting. He decided to do her a solid and not ask about it, fire alignment or, what's what? he asked instead. Her smile turned a little bit more genuine, and a tinge thankful for the topic change, it's a special type of ore that reacts very well to fire type chakra, she was happy to explain, do you know about chakra blades? Yeah, Daiki nodded, I'm wanting to take a look at some while I'm here get a feel for the prices. Good, good, I can recommend you some shops that have good deals then, she beamed, but anyway, I'm sure you know about elemental affinities, the ore you're delivering is a type of ore that for all intents and purposes has its own affinity and will make for for forging fire alignment chakra blades. The reason why this is, is because the land of fire is known for the fact that the vast majority of the common population have an innate fire affinity and it in a sense, resonates with the land itself and the land absorbs this chakra, and in turn produces this ore. Huh, so that was how chakra blades had their unique properties then, that was really interesting to know. So does that mean you import lightning alignment ore for instance, from the land of lightning? Daiki asked, curious. 
For the most part, yes, she confirmed, though, it's not like you can't find water alignment ore in the land of fire. It's just much more common where the water affinity is much more prevalent such as the land of water. I see, Daiki stroked his chin. Then what about chakra blades that aren't aligned to any specific element? He wondered, he knew those were a thing after all. The ore for those are a bit rarer, the secretary shrugged. We generally only get those from the land of iron, and chakra blades from them usually cost a lot more as well. That did make sense to him. Thanks a bunch for explaining this to me. You've cleared up quite a bit for me. He grinned at her, leaning lightly on her desk. I'm Daiki, and you? She smiled prettily at him. Ochako, she introduced herself, and thanks for not asking about that. She trailed off, glancing slightly over her shoulder at the office where he could still faintly make out a pair of male voices arguing. E.H., I'm much more interested in you, he winked, how about once I'm done here, I take you out to dinner and you can show me the best shops to check out for chakra blades? She giggled lightly, cheeks flushing, well, I do finish for the night in less than an hour, she revealed, looking him him over, lingering particularly on his muscular arms, revealed fully by the black tank top he is wearing, he had to show off the gains the grind had bestowed upon him after all. Her gaze drifted to his face and she studied him a bit, cheeks darkening as he wiggled his eyebrows, only to suddenly frown, wait, how old are you Daiki? 13, he revealed hesitantly, once he graduated and got his headband, he was legal after all. Ochako winced, ah, let's shelve that dinner, I can still show you some weapon shops if you want though. Well, that sucked, if it's about the age, I'm a shinobi you know. He pointed out, but, he wouldn't push beyond that. We're not a shinobi village, haven't been for over 50 years, civilians aren't of legal age until 16 here, she replied, sorry, you're just a bit too young for me. Lame, but understandable, fair enough, don't want to make you uncomfortable, he shrugged and let the matter drop. Just because they lived on the same continent, and not really that far from each other, didn't mean their culture would be the same after all. And the world looked very different to a civilian, than it did to a shinobi or kunoichi who had to be prepared to die young or die even the first time they ever left their village. It was a little bit awkward to just sit and chat with the lady who turned him down, on her part at least, Daiki didn't really mind, but she apparently felt bad about it. Thankfully, neither of them had to deal with the awkwardness for much longer, because about roughly 15 minutes after she turned him down, the office doors behind her slammed open, and a large man with messy brown hair, wearing a long buttoned up trench coat stormed out a white headband depicting the symbol of the artisan village atop his forehead, and a large completely black doubled-edged sword, with a shining green jewel held in the tip hanging on his back. He paused for a moment as he caught sight of Daiki, before sneering, a Konoha shinobi. He narrowed his eyes at him, before spitting in disgust and walking away, leaving the room. Daiki watched him go, before turning to Ochako and raising an eyebrow at the older woman. I thought you said you guys don't have shinobi anymore? he asked, curious. Not to mention, he recognized that guy. He was one of his four targets after all, how lucky. She gave him a shaky grimace of a smile, we don't, he's an exception though, I suppose, she sighed, he's part of one of the four families that served the creator of this village and are against not having our own shinobi forces and is doing business with your village in particular. The hell did the guy have against Kono? Is it cause the Naidame Hokage killed the creator of this village? Daiki asked. He'd been surprised to learn that tidbit when he was checking out information about the village before his mission. Yes, sorry about that, Ochako apologized, bowing her head for a moment before standing up, EHM, one moment Daiki, I'll let Tomio-sama know you're here. She stood up from the desk, and made her way into her leader's office. Daiki eyed her backside as she went, it was too bad she was turned off by the age thing, she was pretty hot, a nice rack and she stretched out that pencil skirt she was wearing nicely. Holding up his hands in a cross seal, he summoned a shadow clone to his side. His copy immediately blurred, disappearing to take care of the mission he created it for. To follow that cunt that just left and find out where he was going. Moments later, Ochako came back out and let him know the village leader would see him now. Underscore, the village leader wasn't really in the mood for visitors after dealing with his unpleasant guest, so it was a pretty quick meeting, in and out handing over the package he was given to bring and accepting the payment to bring back to the leaf village. After that, Ochako was, more or less happy to show him around the village, especially the shop's sealing weapons, though she was still walking a bit on eggshells around him. He decided to nip that in the bud, you know, you don't need to feel bad or awkward about turning me down, 
he brought up, it's not a big a deal, I'm not offended or anything. Ochako sighed, that's good, she accepted, I still feel bad though, it takes a lot of courage to ask somebody out after all. Maybe, he agreed, for others, it's kind of not a big issue though, at least to me, when I put my life on the line fighting enemy shinobi all the time, it doesn't seem as hard to do. She paused in her steps and grimaced at his words, but he pushed on, I just thought you're pleasant and beautiful, so shoot my shot, Daiki shrugged, if we he hit it off, cool, if not, could have still been a fun night to remember. He chuckled, and winked at her. It was funny, how knowingly pursuing a path where his life had constant threats to it, made flirting, or at least making his interest in hot girls, incredibly easy and not a big issue. Oh, Ochako uttered, before the meaning of his words seemed to fully register and her cheeks went rosy red and eyes wide, oh. Yup. Daiki unashamedly confirmed. Oh, oh wow, she cupped her cheeks, you're really bold, huh? She peeked up at him. She was a short lady after all, barely reaching five feet, which made her curves stand out. I know what I want, and I go after it when I do. Daiki grinned at her, and boldly let his eyes roam over her body, then met her eyes, and you're definitely worth wanting. Gee give me a minute. Ochako sputtered, face going neon red and turning away from him for a second, probably to gain her bearings. Daiki froze just then, a rush of memories slipping into his mind. His clone had just dispelled itself, giving him the information he needed. He quickly made a clone, covering the smoke with a quick transformation and disappeared out of sight, leaving the clone to take his place and enjoy having the older woman show him around. He had an objective to complete, underscore. Daiki made his way to the roofs, moving in a blur of speed too fast for any civilians to notice. He made his way to the southern district of the village, where a large property surrounded by a huge, spiky topped gate surrounded the perimeter. Despite the size of the property, it wasn't exactly packing in decor. There was a huge semicircular mansion, spread around a grand mausoleum. Considering the fervent boner these guys had for their dead leader, he was willing to bet that was where the corpse of that samey twit that got ganked by Toborama was resting. Maybe I should tag his coffin? Daiki mused with a grin. A big ol' Daiki was here bitches, just for a laugh. He shook his head, nah, that would be way too juvenile, mostly because he didn't want it to be known he was involved with them while they were still in the village. His story relied on them specifically being out of the village after all, which was why he was going to make them disappear, alongside the corpse of their former leader. Grave robbing now I see. Isobu commented, he sounded exasperated. Daiki shrugged, he had to do what he had to do. Not replying back, Daiki focused his chakra into his eyes, allowing him to see through surfaces like the Bayakugan, almost immediately, he clocked onto four figures, all gathered within a large room within the center of the mansion. There we go, he grinned, and focused more chakra into his eyes and focused and voices echoed in his ears. It's completely outrageous. One voice started, coming from the largest of the four, a tall, broad man. Indeed. Another, the shortest agreed. He's a fool, what do you expect, a peace-loving weakling fool, the only female of the quartet spat, shrugging her shoulders, traitorous too, they don't understand the greatness of our family's mission to bring Sami sama back and get back at the leaf village and all the others who have mocked us. Quite right Kujaku, the one he'd followed here nodded approvingly, that's why, we'll just have to do this ourselves. With our ultimate weapons, it won't be hard to defeat the Shukaku and use its chakra. We just have to be patient for a time when the Jinchuriki has left his pitiful village and gone far enough for us not to be fingered, and then we'll slaughter him, drain him dry and kill all the fools of this village for their ignorance. Those who do not support Sami Sama do not deserve to live. The other three burst into cheers and shouts of agreement, happily listing the names of villagers they were going to personally enjoy killing and blah blah blah. They seriously took a sip of the crazy juice didn't they? Daiki snorted, shaking his head in disbelief. These guys really did think a guy who got ganked and killed easily by Toborama Senju over 50 years ago, a guy they'd never even met, was the be-all and end-all to everything. Well, Daiki had seen just about enough. He focused on his seal and drew on Isobu's chakra, the biju willingly helping it along. A moment later, a familiar bubbling red chakra cloak with three swaying red tails formed behind him. Then, Daiki focused on his new eyes, and a second later, Red dust shimmered into existence around him and was absorbed into the cloak and him for good measure. As he did, the chakra signature he was giving off, was completely hidden away. Even if a sensor was standing a single step away from him, 
they wouldn't be able to sense his chakra at all, or isobus now. Hell if another dujutsu user like a Byakugan holder looked at him, they'd probably think he was an illusion or fake because they wouldn't even be able to see his chakra network. Then, Daiki hopped off the roof, over the gate and stealthily, strolled his way over to the mansion, summarily let himself in, and masking his footfalls using his chakra cloak, he made his way through the mansion towards where he could see them with his dujutsu. I should think of a name for these actually, Daiki mused. Crimson or red were too cliche he thought. So maybe, Shinkugan? The, all-concealing scarlet eye? Yeah, that worked. He was a genius for sure. He was the worst enemy of a sensor ninja. Especially since most of them, relied more on their ability to sense chakra, rather than their full on normal physical senses. With his eyes, he could keep constant track of his enemy and their conversation and outright see if any of them had any suspicions, if he wanted to, he could even push it further and see their surface thoughts. The Shinkugan was fucking broken man. Daiki had no idea where it even came from, his best bet was that a Hayuga and an Uchiha got the fucky sucky on and Rinmara was the orphaned or abandoned by product. They didn't notice a thing. Granted, these guys were all scrubs who couldn't stand up to Genin without super special gear. The only true threat was the armor wearing cunt. He had the infinite armor if he remembered right and it could absorb a ton of chakra. Positioning himself in front of the door to where they were discussing, Daiki picked out his targets, his roiling tails raising up behind him and lifting his arms at the ready. Then he kicked the door open, slamming it open against the wall with a bang. The quartet inside the large room, all spread around a large table jumped in alert, but far too slow. He thrust out both hands, at the very same time he whipped his tails through the room. Before they even realized what was going on fully, the woman, the shortest and the guy he followed here were swept up by his tails, and went crunch as he squeezed, pulping them like he did Raiga. The last of the four, found himself submerged in a sea of red chakra, two massive chakra claws forming around him. The armor, as he expected, began rapidly draining the chakra of the claw aimed at his torso, and it quickly withered away and sucked inside the tiger-headed armor strapped to his chest. Too bad that was a feint. The second grasped him by the legs, making the man scream in agony as his bones turned to powder under the grip of the claw and then jerked him back through the air, sending him towards Daiki. A split second later, Daiki shot forward with a punch, his fist meeting the large airborne mons cheek, and snapping his neck, dropping him to the ground, dead a moment later. Daiki blinked, letting the chakra cloak fade from around him, well, that was easy, he noted. He remembered these guys putting up a much bigger fight in the other timeline. Then again, that was against actual Genin and a few Chunin, short talented, very powerful ones for their age. But not ones that could stealthy approach them with the full might of a biju and attack them by surprise at full power. Note to self, the ability to enter biju forms and cloak myself from being sensed at the same time, is utterly broken, he thought to himself. You think, Isobu noted, dryly. He did indeed. Looking around the room, Daiki was about to strip the four of them of their armor before noticing something. He hadn't seen them on his way here in the halls or any rooms he passed, but in here, he could see them clearly. Swords. Swords of varying sizes and shapes, spread about the room and hanging from the walls, giving off a distinct chakra-like aura to his eyes. A lot like the variety of chakra blades he saw when Ochako was showing him around earlier before he switched with his clone and came here. Interesting, very interesting. From what he could see, there was two of each element, crossing over each other and lined up. Despite the fact they were expensive chakra blades, swords at that, each probably worth a good million ryo at least each, they were used as no more than decorative pieces. Yoink! While he was divesting the actual prizes he came here for from the bodies of his victims, he grabbed them as well. Then he sealed the bodies away while he was at that, he was especially careful not to break anything, to make it look as if they had left without any struggle and disappeared somewhere. He'd get rid of the bodies later. While he was at it, Daiki scoured the mansion with clones, looking for anything of interest. He found quite a bit of Ryo, and took half of it, again, he wanted to make sure that it looked like they willingly left themselves and were not attacked in any way. But beyond that, he found nothing else of note. Beyond a scroll that went into the various abilities of the four weapons that combined together to form the ultimate weapon. Huh. So the shape can be customized, Daiki read, meaning, it didn't have to take on that stupid looking thing Sami had done with them? Well, that was good and really interesting. 
The flame blade and weaklessness soaring short swords apparently couldn't change shape, but the main tiger-faced armor could more or less take on a custom appearance decided on by the user who connected their chakra to it, and the three odd green orbs spread about the three swords that came together, apparently, when combined into the ultimate weapon, gave the user the ability to float. Neat. Not that he really needed it, but still neat. I'll check these out more later. Daiki shrugged, sealing the scroll away in his palm and preparing to leave. He had to grab Sami's corpse and get out of Dodge. He'd get a hotel room for the night and then head out in the morning. I'll hit up Tanzaku Gai first before heading back, he thought as he made his way back out towards the entrance of the mansion. The closest bounty station that he remembered was hid in a urinal not far from the place. He had no idea why in a urinal though. Daiki paused, blinking, huh? He uttered, and then a smirk spread across his face. His clone had just popped and sent the memories to him. Apparently while he was busy here, the clone had gotten a quick bite with Ochako, before walking her home and bidding her goodbye. He'd flirted with her a bit more, and she actually gave an A for a bit. He made out with her, even felt her up a bit, before she broke off and headed inside her house, bidding him goodbye. Sure he may have played the issue up a little that he could really die anytime, and she felt a bit sorry for him and got roped in a little bit, but E.H. If he wanted, he probably could have pushed the issue with her, but, that was enough for him. Nice. Daiki chuckled, praising himself. In a really good mood now and with a whistle on his lips and a jaunty spring in his step, the young Jenin made his way out to go yoink a corpse from a grave. That was just how he rolled. The next morning, Daiki was posing in front of the mirror in the hotel room he purchased for the night. What do you think? The boy asked. I think you look like a bandit that is trying to look like a big shot. I so be deadpanned. You mean like a handsome rogue? Daiki grinned, curling his bicep at the mirror and eyeing himself. His clothing had went through a little bit of a change this morning. He hadn't exactly been too tired last night, what with him being a new jinchuriki and all and having more energy than he ever remembered having before. So he played about with some of his loot through the night to pass the time. And in the process, found a very interesting feature in one of the items he'd liberated, and given a new home like the ever generous and caring saintly lad he was. Well, his clothes hadn't changed that much. He was still wearing his black combat sandals and his black pants, and he was still wearing his tank top. The only real change was the single armored blue harness over his right shoulder, while atop it sat the face of a roaring, spiky faced turtle. Why did you have to make it look like my face? I so bu grimaced. Gotta represent. He shrugged. See, during the night, when going over the plans those morons had for their ultimate weapon, he found something very interesting. There was actually a lot of seal work involved in the creation of the infinite armor as they called it, the basis of their plan. See, Daiki originally thought it just siphoned chakra that yeah, while useful, wasn't something you know, worth wearing something so lame looking. Only, when he looked further into workings of the armor, he found it wasn't quite so simple, yes, it was designed to absorb chakra. But that wasn't all. No, on top of that, it also had the function to direct that chakra to someone else, or, convert that chakra into pure life force and give it to someone. When he figured that out, Daiki kind of understood why their plan was to go after the Ichibi. They needed a vast amount of life force to revive their master, Sami. The only thing I can't figure out, is how filling up his corpse with life energy and basically bringing his body to life again, yoinked his soul back from the afterlife, Daiki mused. If it was just a matter of there possibly not being an afterlife, he'd maybe understand, but no, there very clearly was one, called the pure land even. Well, either way, until he figured out how the seals worked on it to recreate the work on his own, Daiki could put the infinite armor to good use. For example, recovering his lost life force from using the hero's water nearly a month ago by having Isobu fill it up with his chakra and then converting it to life force and slurping it up. I should remind you, I am not a chakra dispenser for all the crazy ideas you come up with, Isobu pointed out dryly. You didn't say no though, Daiki reminded him with a chuckle. Isobu did not reply. Well, the infinite armor wasn't the only thing he'd found had some nifty extra features he didn't know. For example, the pair of shining silver blades idly rotating midair beside him. Apparently the Kiba blades could be remotely controlled by the wielder. Combined with inscribing the link seal to his dimension force seal, so he could return them to it wherever they were, well, he could think of so many fun ways to play about with them. 
Daiki really wanted to find out who in the hell made the Kiba blades, because they were fucking overpowered. Samahata just got bumped down to second place on the totem pole. He eyed the blades, massive grin spread across his face for a few moments, before with a thought, returning the airborne blades to his seal. As much as he would just love to play about with them right now, he had shit to do. To Tanzaku Gai to drop off ahead, collect some sweet sweet dosh and then back to Konoha to face the music. Underscore, fucking Madara. Daiki grumbled hours later as he left the public urinal, house to the Tanzaku Gai bounty station behind. Scowling, Daiki kicked a rock and watched it soar off into the distance, that guy's made an enemy for life, he vowed. No seriously, fuck that guy. Him and Obito actually, he knew the real one had a hand in the initial situation and Obito just continued it on because he was a salty fuck. Yes, vow to angrily end them, but no, not for the fact their schemes have killed tens of thousands and put the very world at risk, but because they lowered the economy of the mist village and in turn, lowered the bounty for the man you killed. Isobu sounded very exasperated. Daiki paused. Well when you say it like, you make me sound unreasonable, he replied. You're very unreasonable actually, you have too much tunnel vision, Isobu replied simply. Well excuse him for being disappointed that the head of one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the bloody mist, was only worth 5 million ryo. You looted 5 million from that mansion in the village of artisans just last night, after looting weaponry that in total must be worth over a hundred million. Isobu deadpanned. It was the principle of the matter, Isobu sighed and did not comment any further. Daiki supposed he won then, it wasn't like he was, what was the word, ungrateful, truly disappointed, whatever, it wasn't like he was actually down about getting 5 million ryo on top of getting what he actually wanted from Raiga. But freaking Asuma Seru Tobi was worth 35 million, Daiki thought he'd get at least 20 for Raiga. And he could have gotten himself a sweet new pad with loads of dosh left over for sure. Guess I just need to grind up my wallet as well. He mused, shrugging and getting to move on. While he was here in Tanzaku Gai, he may as well go to one of the leaf outposts and send a messenger hawk back to the village. Top it off with a message for the Hokage's eyes only, very urgent, and fill it up with some vague stuff about tails, turtles and such. Prepare him in advance and make sure the man knew he was thinking of the village first. Even though he wasn't, he continued on, making his way into the village and traversing through it to the other side where the outpost was. On the way, right in the middle of the entertainment district, a large street known for being, vice, central, with many a casino and bar, a flash of white in Daiki's peripheral caught his eye. If it wasn't for his new eyes, he wouldn't have even noticed with how brief it was. But with the Shinkugan, he could see much clearer and in much more detail even in the corner of his eye than he did from his previous full eyes. It was a long mane of white hair, hello ladies. Daiki turned and stared, watching as a tall, broad-shouldered man in green and red, with a large and long mane of white hair boldly swaggered his way into a brothel. Impassion, that was the name he read off of the sign atop the two-story, motel lookalike of a building. Well, at least they knew what they were about. To think he'd run into Jiraiya of the Sanin of all people here, on his way back to the village. Granted, from what he remembered, the sand dame recalled him to return during the Chunin exams, so the guy had to have been in the general area. I can use this. Daiki's lips quirked up into a brief calculating smirk. He knew of course when he returned to the village and let things slip, he would be questioned quite a bit and examined, he just wasn't scared of his secrets being pulled from his mind, because anyone that entered his mind was going to meet his big, giant three-tailed turtle buddy. But, what if he went to Jiraiya, had him examine his seal? confirmed the okay and then sent the message back to the Hokage? Well, then he'd have a rock-solid alibi now wouldn't he? And if he spun it right, like being hesitant to return to the village as he was right now? Well, wouldn't that just paint him in a shining patriotic light? Honestly, Daiki found himself having to resist the urge to rub his palms together and let out a rather Orochimaru-like, kukakuku. He didn't of course because he just didn't fit that look and it would make him look cartoonishly evil. He was debonairly evil after all. Please don't apply words to yourself that you clearly don't understand the meaning of, Isobu sighed. Some people just couldn't appreciate his style it seemed. Plan branching out in his mind, Daiki followed the man into the building. As soon as he entered, the cleaning of bottles and drinking glasses, boasting men and cooing women entered his ears. It didn't take him long at all to find his target. Jiraiya was already sitting at a booth, sake on the table, 
his arms around a pair of particularly voluptuous and scantily clad ladies, both blonde, one long pigtails, the other in a high ponytail. He clearly had a type. Ignoring the going-ons around him, lest he fall to temptation and take a few of these whores to pound town when the grind awaited, Daiki made his way over to the booth. Jiraiya-sama, hello. Daiki greeted him politely. The white-haired man looked up from where he was staring into the valley of a lovely pair of tits and raised an eyebrow at him. Oh, is this a friend of yours Jiraiya-kun? Busty pigtails cooed, rubbing the mon's chest. He's quite the cutie, and look at those muscles. Ponytail agreed, eyeing his arms. Daiki resisted the urge to flex. The gains from the grind were designed to do so after all. Something like that, Jiraiya narrowed his eyes for a brief second at Daiki, before grinning at him. Bit young to be in here are you not kid? Not really, Daiki shrugged. Actually, I'd probably be following your lead right about now if I didn't need to talk to you about something important. Kinda busy here, Jiraiya answered with a shrug inside eyeing both the women beside him, then jerking his head and urging Daiki to leave. The gallant and handsome Jiraiya will gladly give you an autograph later, like say, tomorrow if you're still here. Well, it wasn't like Daiki didn't understand the situation here, he'd be pissed too if he was about to plow the ever-loving shit out of two hot-ass women like this and some punk-ass cock blocker interrupted him. Alright, I suppose I can wait, Daiki shrugged back, I just thought you'd be interested in this really huge turtle I found the other day. A turtle? Jiraiya looked at him as if he were crazy, completely confused. Yeah, a super huge turtle, he nodded, bigger than any living creature I've ever seen before, heck. I bet there could only be eight others at most in existence. He added, lifting up three fingers. Jiraiya's eyes widened. I see, a huge turtle huh? Consider me interested. He unwound his arms from around the ladies of the night and stood up. Jiraiya-kun? Pigtails gave him a confused look. Haha, sorry ladies, but it seems this young little tadpole needs the guidance of the gallant Jiraiya. The white-haired man laughed boisterously, but don't mind it, I'll make sure to come see you two again later make sure to keep yourselves free for me. Bidding the ladies goodbye, the legendary Toad Sanin hopped over the booth table in a smooth motion drawing, oohs and ahs from the ladies, and placed an arm around Daiki's shoulder and then the world blurred around them as they were suddenly moving. Moments later, they appeared on the roof of a building on the opposite side of the street from the whorehouse. I hope this isn't a joke kid, Jiraiya clicked his tongue, letting go of Daiki, you said you found the Sanbi? Man, this guy was absurdly fast. If he wasn't wrong, he was actually faster than Daiki was even in his three-tailed cloak form. It showed him how far he still had to go. I did, Daiki confirmed. I came across the Sanbi yesterday on my way through the land of rivers, during a mission to the village of artisans. Jiraiya grimaced that, could be bad, the tall white-haired man crossed his arms, tensions are already high with the sand, and the land of rivers is right in between the lands of wind and fire if they catch wind of it being there and move to capture for it. Well, it's not exactly there anymore. Daiki cut his thoughts off. What? Jiraiya stopped cold and blinked. What do you mean it's not there anyway? Biju aren't exactly subtle. Hell actually, if you came across it, why are you still standing here? You're a genin right? I don't get the feel of a janin off of you at least. Why aren't you dead? Yeah, about that. Daiki pulled down the collar of his shirt and channeled chakra allowing his four symbols sealed to appear on his torso, Jiraiya's eyes widened in shock, see, I kind of came across a bunch of guys having subdued it and wanting to use it to attack the leaf village, so I kind of jumped in and sealed it inside myself when they were tired out. You, dot you, dot you what? Jiraiya gaped at him, fish mouthed and eyes wide. Jiraiya, for a moment, thought he was having some form of crazy fever dream, that or he was just drunk out of his gourd and hallucinating. Let me get this straight, he rubbed at the bridge of his nose and looked at the muscular kid, wearing a weird turtle face thing on his shoulder as if it was stylish or something, during your mission to deliver ore to the village of artisans, you found their little noble wannabe ninja planning to revive their dead leader and strike out at the village, that right? Right. The kid nodded, those ominous crimson eyes of his holding his gaze. Eyes that apparently didn't belong to him until yesterday at that. So you decided to follow them and spy on them even when they left the village itself, only to find them meeting up with Raiga Kurosaki, formerly of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen, he asked next. Yup. The kid nodded, crossing his absurdly muscular arms for his age. What kind of crazy training regiment was this kid going through anyway? He was built like a brick shithouse. 
give him a few years and he may end up making the rakage look puny. With Raiga in tow alongside a partner of his, they traveled to the south of the land of rivers, to a massive lake, where the sandby was, and drew it out, then using that armor on your shoulder, they drained most of its chakra and then hypnotized it with those eyes you have now to keep it docile. Pretty much, the kid nodded, pulling his arms out of their crossed position to point at his eyes, I think they have the ability to cast genjutsu through the eyes like the sharingan, but I don't really know any proper genjutsu so can't tell yet. More genjutsu eyes, lovely stuff that. He'd totally need to look into the possibility of a clan with eyes like that, they could be a real problem in the future if they became enemies. Right, more or less with you so far, Jiraiya replied, and he was, and he could understand it. There were plenty of people that wanted to get their hands on the biju. He knew of a specific group in particular after all that was after them. What I don't get, is what possessed you to pull some maniac plan out of your ass and literally steal the sandby out from under them, like seriously kid, what the hell is wrong with you? What kind of crazy bastard would willingly seal a biju inside themselves? Jinchuriki were pretty much universally treated like trash. He winced at that as soon as he thought it. He really needed to check up on Naruto more often. The kid gave a flip and shrug, they wanted to soup up their weapons, revive some guy that fought the Naidame Hokage and direct a biju at the village. He pointed out as if the answer was obvious, by sealing the sandby inside myself. I made sure that would never happen, even if I died in the process, the sandby would take time to reform and invalidate their plans completely. Jiraiya sighed as he digested the kid's words, he wasn't wrong. That was the problem though, for a kid this age to be so willing to throw his life away for the village, it made his guts royal. He was a genin for crying out loud. Situations like what he apparently got caught up in, were missions for the likes of himself, or at least Kakashi or something. Not a fresh little rookie, no matter how big his muscles or his skill with seals. Because that definitely couldn't be denied. It was rough around the edges, that but that was a pretty damn solid four symbol seal the kid had put on himself. Things worked out pretty well in the end, despite what I thought though, the kid continue on pulling him from his thoughts, the sandby was grateful enough to work with me straight away to put them down, and with them exhausted and with the sandby's power amping me up, I killed them all, took their shit and decided to take these eyes while I was at it. I'm pretty good with the mystical palm jutsu so I figured, best not to let them go to waste, you know? No, not, you know, Jiraiya wanted to scream at the boy. Who the hell trivialized ripping out their own eyes and replacing them with another's, talking about it as if it were only worth a passing mention, like the weather or something. This kid gave him some serious Orochimaru vibes. But at least he could admit they were more of the positive kind. Orochimaru would have never confronted a superior force, exhausted or not and steal their prey right out from under them knowing he'd most likely die in the process just to protect the village. This is so absurd. Jiraiya shook his head in disbelief sitting his ass down on the ledge of the roof they were on. It was such an utterly crazy, off the walls stupid situation of a story, that there was no way the kid could be making it up. Like seriously, making chakra weapons to subdue a biju, teaming up with a member of the seven ninja swordsmen and a guy with an unknown dujutsu he'd never even heard of before, to revive a guy who had been dead for well over 50 years now, hell, the guy was dead before Jiraiya was even born for crying out loud and he was an old fogey himself now. God, the series of events was literally so stupidly retarded that nobody would tell a story like that with a straight face unless it was true. And to make things even more ludicrous, the Sanbi apparently had taken a liking to the kid. He really needed another drink right about now to digest this shit. Team 8 reporting, mission complete Hokage-sama. Here is in wished Kuranai wouldn't be so formal with him all the time. She was a dutiful young lass no doubt, but sometime in the future. There was a good chance of her becoming his daughter-in-law if the amount of rendezvous she and Asuma had together over the past year since he returned from the Guardian Ninja was anything to go by. Then again, his days would be much more enjoyable if people in general were a lot less formal around him, sadly, that only applied to boisterous rascals like Naruto-kun. Splendid work. He praised the rookie Genin lightly, idly reading over the report Kuranai handed to him of their delivery mission, favoring the three young ninja with a warm smile. Young Shino inclined his head in acceptance of the praise, while Kiba-kun grinned widely, thumping his nose proudly. His eyes landed on the Hyuga heiress and rested on her for a moment. My, how quickly youths could change indeed. Only a few weeks ago would the timid girl have ducked her head down after meeting his eyes shyly, but now she held his gaze and smiled back politely. 
Daiki Kun's work. He mused, according to Kakashi at least. Apparently, the young genin whose ethic had caught his eye recently, had came across her watching over Naruto. The young girl's infatuation with the boy was well known to him. She was always watching the boy and he saw her frequently not far away when he was checking on the boy himself. The boy had wrought quite the change in the Hyuga girl, it was almost like looking at another girl entirely. While not a tall girl by any stretch, she always seemed so much more tiny with the way she shrunk in on herself and hid away in baggy clothing. Now, her spine was straight, there was some pride to the girl now, he idly wondered what Daiki said to her to bring about a change quite like this. And that wasn't even going into her physical changes, she'd swapped out her general attire for a new outfit. Switching from blue pants to black and replacing her baggy white jacket with a lavender and white zipper. And in just a few weeks, her hair had grown massively, reaching all the way down to her mid-back. Not a natural hair growth of course, most likely a salon run by a former shinobi or kunoichi with medic nin training. He knew that the mystical palm jutsu could be used to massively increase the speed at which hair grew it. A few sessions in a salon like that would account for her hair growth. Just then, there was a puff of smoke beside his arm on the table he was sitting beside, a small green toad appearing from within it, a scroll strapped to his back. E.H., a frog. Young Kiba cried in shock. A toad actually, here is and corrected gently, reaching over to pluck the scroll from the toad's back, at which point it promptly disappeared, one of my students summons to be exact. A message from Jirai Yasama, Kuranai noted. Indeed. Here is and nodded, unfurling the scroll. He wondered why Jiraiya was sending him a message now, it was only the other day they corresponded on the matter of him coming back to the village. Naruto had used the Kyubi's chakra for the first time during Team 7's mission to wave, and his student was a much more able user of Fuenjutsu than him, so he wanted him to check the 8 trigram seal and make sure there was no damage to it. One could never be too careful with the Kyubi after all. Quickly, he began glancing over the scroll reading the contents, and his mouth open eyes widening ever so slightly, only to gradually, bit by bit, get progressively wider. The Sanbi, a newly discovered dujutsu, a plot against the village, a member of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist village, chakra weapons that could rival the weapons of the seven legendary weapons of the mist. And in the middle of it all, young Daiki, leaping into action to protect the village from such a possible threat, in the process, becoming a jinchuriki, no, by all accounts a perfect jinchuriki, gaining possession of a new dujutsu and claiming the legendary Kiba blades for his own, on top of killing not only a known rank shinobi, but multiple other powerful shinobi as well, at least all of Chunin rank. For a moment, Hiruzen felt the urge to laugh, it was quite the tall tale after all. Except, he never found anything remotely hinting at, haha, got you good. He circulated his chakra through his system quickly just to make sure there wasn't some form of genjutsu woven into the scroll that caught him without him noticing it upon unrolling it. But no, it was real. To think the Sanbi was so close by with none the wiser. His thoughts raced. That was a disaster waiting to happen. And to think, the village of artisan nobles had teamed up with a missing ninja to capture it. All to revive Sami. He grimaced. He himself was a but a young lad when his sensei killed the man but he well remembered the arrogance and contemptuous ease in which the man ripped the lives of those weaker than him and tormented those he ruled above. He was a tyrant with delusions of grandeur far above his station, and when he set his sights upon the leaf village, he and his followers were put down like dogs by the Naidame Hokage. In of themselves, Raiga Kurosaki and the Four Celestials, as they were called by Seimi, were no match for the leaf, even with this dujutsu user with them. Having a biju unleashed within their midst though, which they apparently planned to do after using the biju for all it was worth, was a different matter entirely. Oh, he was sure they'd be able to suppress the sanbi, there was no doubt, but even with Kakashi and Danzo backing him up, Hiruzen knew it would not be an easy or quick fight, especially if they weren't expecting it. The loss of life in the village would be massive, the only reason the casualties during the time the Kayubi got loose from Kashina weren't much larger, was because he got lucky that was all and was able to push it out of the village. That same tactic would not work with the Sanbi, not with its massively armored shell. Far from the strongest of the Biju, the Sanbi was nonetheless, the most durable of them all. It was a scenario he did definitely did not want taking place in the village, and thankfully, apparently according to the efforts of young Daiki, they wouldn't need to. It was a lot to process so suddenly. Hokage-sama? Kurinai's voice broke him from his thoughts. 
Here is in coughed, sorry, you're dismissed. I was caught up thinking. He smiled at the Jonan and her team. You know how old minds like mine tend to wander, he joked. She smiled back at him briefly, before bowing her head and escorting her team out. Here is in wasted no time in excusing himself from the mission desk and making his way back to his office. He ruminated on the last part of the message Jiraiya had sent him. The way he's set up the seal is incredibly risky, the Sanbi could leave at any point it wants. Honestly, it should have left right after helping him out, it can't be that grateful, right? Honestly, I've never spoke to any of the Biju, the most I know is from Kashina talking about the Kayubi. But, the kid was happy to explain why, and what a doozy it is. The Sanbi itself feels safer inside the kid. The kid apparently is willing to work with it and that makes a big difference for it, especially with what the Sanbi itself apparently claims, enough to the point where it's willing to lend the kid its full power if he asks for it. The former Mizukage, he was being controlled, by a man with a Sharingan, claiming to be Madara Uchiha. Bullshit of course, the man is long dead, but, we've got an AWOL Uchiha out there who isn't Itachi Uchiha. Cuz, apparently he actually attacked the former Mizukage as well at some point. And this mystery Uchiha has the ability to control a cage with his eyes alone. Here is in grimmest. Madara Uchiha. Someone claiming to be him, with the visual prowess to control a cage, was not someone to be taken lightly. Not at all the real Madara's style, he'd only met the man a few times as a lad himself, but he was aware of what type of person he was, anyone who met the man was. His wife, dearly departed Bawako had met him as a child herself, and even just the man smiling at her had terrified her to the bone. Perhaps a direct descendant, he thought to himself. Madara spent much time outside the village before he went rogue and had his climactic battle to the end with Hashirama-sama. The man's disgust for his own clan later was well established as well, so it was unlikely he had any descendants within the village before the Uchiha massacre. How troubling. Here is an entered his office, collapsing on his chair and rubbing his forehead. Tensions with the sand were rising every single day and Onoki was always watching and waiting, sitting on that fence of his and prepared to strike if the opportunity presented itself. And he could never tell what way Kumo would go, but he knew already that they were well prepared should a new war break out. Still, it seemed a silver lining had come from the machinations of this mysterious Uchiha. Daiki-kun has the full might of a biju behind him. Here is amused. That. That was splendid news. Especially confirmed by Jiraiya. The situation would still bear watching closely, but. Hiruzen's eyes drifted to the bottom of the scroll where Jiraiya described the rough plan to capture the Sanbi and keep it docile. Daiki had both the equipment and the dujutsu now that were used, so if the Sanbi did act up, he should be capable of subduing it on his own quite possibly, especially considering the fact he had apparently gotten good enough already to replicate the seal he'd seen used on the Nanabi Jinchuriki. Such stupendous talent for the art. The old man's eyes drifted to one of the Fu pictures hanging on the wall of his office, one depicting a handsome, blonde-haired man. Perhaps he'll rival you in a few years? He mused. Daiki had really went beyond the call of duty. And according to Jiraiya, the boy had been prepared to lose his life in the process just to attempt to stop their plans for the Leaf Village. Thankfully, the boy was intelligent and picked his timing well, when his opponents were at their very weakest putting good use to that ruthless ability he had during combat that Kakashi reported of during his mission towards the waterfall village. His will of fire burned brightly indeed. Ah Jen Makun, if only you had looked just a bit deeper. Hiruzen shook his head. Alas, Genma had wanted a full team of his own, not an apprentice, so no matter how young Daiki impressed him with his talent during his test, it was his teammates that became the weights too heavy for his talent alone to carry. He idly remembered the academy report on the boy. Uruka had personally written his file. Noting how the boy was above average in all aspects of being a shinobi. But spread himself too thin, he had been lacking direction as a shinobi and that if he had focused more on one or two aspects of being a shinobi over them all, he would have most likely been a contender for the strongest in his graduating class. And even then, if kept up the rate of growth he was at anyone in all disciplines, he would most likely be a jonin in all aspects by his early twenties, which in of itself was very impressive. Or he could work just that much harder. Here is in mused. After he had a nasty run-in with Iwa Shinobi on his first C-rank mission and only narrowly avoided losing his life, the boy had thrown himself into his training in a way that would stupefy even Guy. Draining his chakra to the barest hints left before chakra exhaustion, 
physically training until his body was numb and his muscles crying for rest. Every single day, only to then increase that training when he got his hands on the mystical palm jutsu and used it to increase the rate at which his physical conditioning progressed. Looking at the boy objectively, he was by far the most standout of his generation, even beyond the likes of Sasuke Uchiha and Neji Hayuga. He was strong for his age, dutiful to his training, beyond dutiful, pragmatic, no hesitation in dealing with enemy combatants permanently, had the intelligence to do well in most situations, had no fear to face stronger opponents, was bold, decisive, cunning and cared for his comrades. Hiruzen had been impressed by his training ethic when he looked in on the boy, Kakashi, putting aside the mont's amusement and teasing the boy, had nothing but good things to say about him, and even Jiraiya seemed to be praising the boy as well. He would definitely go far in the future, that was for sure, perhaps he'll take over for me one day? Hiruzen mused with a small chuckle. Give it a few years, the boy may just approach Kakashi's level, perhaps even beyond, and with the full power of a biju behind him. Well, the boy would not lack for the strength needed for the role, and he had the fire to put his own life on the line to protect the village. All that was truly needed, was to see how well he led others and he could gain that experience as a chunin for sure. Yes, that might not be a bad idea. I'm not getting any younger after all, Hiruzen snorted. It was about time a new candidate for the Godem stepped up to the plate, the only two on the table right now were Kakashi and Jiraiya after all, and Jiraiya would never accept the role. For some reason, after he checked Daiki's seal out for him, confirmed that it was done well and sent a message back to the village with his summons for him, Jiraiya pretty much was done with him, didn't even invite him back into the whorehouse with him. How rude. You're getting too much enjoyment out of this. Isobu pointed out as he made his way through the gates of the leaf village. Tanzaku guy was only about an hour or so away at top speed for him after all. Come on, he's a legendary ninja, don't tell me you didn't get a kick out of dropping our story on him and watching him cycle through different variations of shock, Daiki retorted. It truly was the little things that mattered the most in the end. Maybe a little, but you should be careful this does not come back to bite you. You painted quite the picture of yourself after all. The three-tailed biju replied. Daiki honestly didn't see how. Sure, his excuse story painted him as a very pragmatic person willing to put his life on the line for the village should a threat arise to it and he was in the vicinity no matter how little of a chance he stood. Actually, when put like that, he saw Isobu's point. Well, it's not like they'll ask something absurd of me like laying my life down anytime soon. I'm a perfect jinchuriki. I should be about as valuable to the leaf as Killer B is to Kumo. Daiki shrugged. Honestly, the most annoying thing was probably going to be people hanging over his shoulder or maybe trying to suck up to him to endear him even further to the leaf. With that thought in mind, he made his way through the village, making his way straight to the Hokage Tower. Underscore, Daiki kun. What do you think of being Hokage? The Sandame asked. What? Underscore, rewinding to less than a half an hour before, Daiki made his way into the office, finding the Sandame Hokage already waiting for him. The old man had divested himself of his hat, and had turned his chair around so he could stare out over the village from the window. Ah, Daiki kun, he glanced back over his shoulder, a small smile on his face directed at him as Daiki closed the door to the older Mont's office behind his back. Good to see you back, I hear you've had quite the adventure during your last mission. Daiki idly glanced around the office, but he saw nobody else present and no chakra signatures in the immediate vicinity of the circular office. It was quite a trip for sure, he focused on the Hokage and nodded. Sarutobi chuckled, I'll bet, he replied, before spinning slowly around in his chair to face Daiki and directing his warm smile at the boy, before we get to anything else, I must say this. Thank you my boy, you have done much for the safety of this village during your mission and you deserve the highest praise I can give. I mean you could also promote me to Jonin, Daiki replied, lips quirking up a bit. The Hokage chuckled again, well, I dare say that isn't far off, in fact, I'd like to at least promote you to Chunin this very moment, you deserve that, he replied, but, the Chunin exams are coming up soon as you no doubt remember. Yeah? Where was he going with this? In pure fighting ability alone, even before your recent, changes, you are quite capable of performing the duties of a Chunin, the Sandame pointed out, now though, I suspect even without your new friend's power, you have grown quite massively in fighting ability and that presents us with an opportunity. In the Chunin exams, Daiki raised an eyebrow. Indeed, it's just an idle thought I had while waiting for you to return. Sarutobi threaded his fingers together lightly, 
and looked him in the eye. You're of course officially a genin right now, as such, eligible for the exams. And what I mean by this, is you're strong enough to put on a very good show during exams. I dare say, you could dominate the competition, no? Oh, he saw what he was getting at. Maybe, there's a few other genin to look out for, but none I can see that I can't beat. Daiki nodded. The only real problem was Neji, not even Lee. Lee had a crippling weakness to genjutsu and, while well, he now had access to a pretty powerful genjutsu through Isobu. But there was still roughly a month left before the Chunin exams, and he could now use much more clones freely and had a bunch of Yugura's techniques ready and waiting for him. With those, plus the Kiba blades, he wouldn't even need Isobu's chakra to beat the Hyuga. I like your confidence my boy, the Sandame grinned a bit. Assuming there are no special outliers, I dare say you will win this Chunin exams coming up definitively and make quite the splash, that is, if you accept. Accept? Daiki blinked. Yes, as I said, I'm of mind to promote you to Chunin here and now, Sarutobi nodded, but, if you would like to hold off, I will use this Chunin exams to gauge your ability in full as a shinobi myself, and, should you show the ability required, come the end of the Chunin exams, you will skip straight past Chunin and become a Jonin. Daiki blinked. Before his eyes widened, wait, seriously? That sounded awesome? Forget toiling away after becoming a Chunin to get the requirements needed to become a Jonin, or at least qualified to be tested as one. If he did this, he would disregard all that annoyance and focus more on his grind. Or he could become a Chunin right here and now. Honestly, objectively, no matter what one he picked, he was just winning here wasn't he? I don't have a team for the Chunin exams. He pointed out, he would have to find two members. That, is not an issue either, the Hokage grinned lightly, I want you to make a splash after all, so if you accept, I will allow you to take part without a team if you so desire, though if you do, I can arrange for some teammates to join you. Wasn't the whole thing about the Leaf being big on teamwork and the like? Though, not that he couldn't see the Hokage's point here either. Everyone else would be in a team, so if one guy easily rushed through what took everyone else three men squads to do, it would make Konoha look even better and more competent. And the Hokage could pull some sneaky sneaky tactics for the exams here, specifically because the next Chunin exams were being held here in Konoha. It's too good not to accept, Daiki said finally, let me ask something though. He added, brows furrowing, something felt a little off. Ask away Daiki kun. The old man replied. There are quite a few requirements to being a Jonin. Two of the main ones being proficient in at least two elements of ninjutsu and of course being strong enough for the position. Daiki listed, before adding. But Jonin are squad commanders as well. They need to be capable leaders. How will I go about proving that if I go solo? Well, the Chunin exams are more for measuring your tactical ability and general fighting ability. You can't move beyond Jenin without either, and Chunins themselves lead Jenin to gain experience for becoming Jonin and squad commander, the Sandame mused, but, exceptions can be made for those that truly excel in other paths, one of our strongest Jonin for instance, has no ability in elemental jutsu at all. Oh, oh, he was talking about Guy. And actually, Neji never showed any elemental ninjutsu ability and he was a Jonin after the time skip as well. Beyond that, it's a chance I wish to reward you with for your efforts, the Hokage mused, learning to lead, can always come later, though a part of this does pertain to your mission to the waterfall village. Kakashi gave quite glowing report on you and your leadership during that debacle impressing him. Daiki blinked, leadership, he didn't really lead that time though, not much at least, he directed Sakura for sure and was the main combatant, and Sasuke had deferred to him a few times during combat, but that was it. And he didn't think Kakashi actually thought that high of him. Guess that cunt wasn't as big a prick as he liked to pretend he was. Alright, I'll accept, Daiki shrugged, he had nothing stopping him from doing so with what the older man told him. Being a Jonin meant not only could he do higher paying missions, but he also had a higher status than anyone not of the Jonin rank and meant less people could order him around, and I'll do it solo, that'll make it seem more impressive. Sarutobi nodded, good, good, I'll look forward to your participation then he replied. And then silence. Daiki expected the man to bring up, well, everything. But the man just stared at Daiki, smiling warmly at him. M, he trailed off for a moment before coughing, don't you want to you know, bring up everything else? The Sandame's smile didn't change, he didn't even blink, no, I think I know all I need to, he said simply, Jiraiya-kun was quite thorough in what was planned by our enemies, your part in things and what you gained from your brave actions. You don't want to ask about anything? The Biju, 
The Kiba blades? None of it? Daiki was utterly lost. Why didn't he want to ask? And it wasn't like he told Jiraiya the full abilities his new eyes had and the like either. Hmm, well now that you bring it up, there is one thing I'd like to ask you. Sarutobi hummed lightly. What? Daiki blurted out and asked. The man chuckled lightly, before staring him straight in the eye. Daiki kun. What do you think of being Hokage? The Sandam asked. What? I'm sorry. What? Daiki gaped at the man. I think my ears might be blocked a bit or something, because it sounded like you just asked me if I wanted to be Hokage? Sarutobi chuckled, not quite, he shook his head, I was just idly thinking to myself you see, that, your potential is not small and I considered the possibility that you may take over for me sometime in the future. Oh, that was what meant. That made more sense, but still. Him, Hokage? He'd never even considered it before. I consider only the possibility my boy, Sarutobi cut in before his thoughts could rapidly diverge in all different directions, your potential is not small, with your ethic of training and talent, even without the Sanbi, I could see you reaching the level of Kakashi one day, perhaps beyond. And with the Sanbi itself backing you, you will definitely have the strength needed, alongside that, your loyalty to the village itself cannot be called into question, you are a true bearer of the will of fire. And you think I'd be a good Hokage? Daiki asked him, disbelieving. Never mind a team. He barely had anyone that qualified as a friend. How the hell would he look after an entire shinobi village? The potential is there for sure. The Sandame continued smiling at him. A few years from now at most, and you will be well qualified for the seat, especially with a little help along the way. Daiki honestly didn't know how to respond to all this to be honest. Can I get back to you? He said, awkwardly. Sarutobi chuckled. There's no rush right now, he replied gently take your time to think it over, I bring this up only because we have a severe lack of candidates now, but think you could step up to the plate in the near future if you so desire. Right, Daiki nodded in daze. The old man thankfully dismissed him from there, dropping no other bombs on him and let him leave. What was that about not asking anything absurd of you? Isobu asked with a snort as soon as he left the office behind. He couldn't even bring up the desire to snipe back at the turtle Biju. He needed to throw himself into the grind and clear his mind. He was back. Even from outside the training ground, Hinata could hear the loud sounds of training, masculine shouts and the ground trembling slightly beneath her feet. Hinata had come around yesterday, after she was done with her mission with her team, but Daiki was nowhere to be seen, it seemed he had been on a mission. Her feet had only idly carried her here after morning training with her team, she hadn't felt like going back home to her clan compound to rest yet. Reaching behind her, Hinata nervously smoothed down her now much longer hair. She wondered, how would he react? She hadn't had the time to show him yet because of how busy she'd been with missions and training, the last she'd seen her former classmate had been over a week ago. Will he like it? She found herself wondering. The last few weeks, she'd taken his words to heart and followed his advice and felt bolder than she ever had before. Kiba and Shino had been very taken aback with her change at first. Crude and crass as his words had been, very unlike the Hyuga clan as a whole, that was nonetheless what made them stick with her. Daiki was bold and upfront, he had felt no need to mince words with her. He was utterly genuine. Shaking her head, Hinata swallowed the nervousness building up inside her and forced herself to boldly make her way into the training ground. As she did, she was just in time to see Daiki shooting forward spinning and lashing out with a knee strike that shattered straight through a large rock wall about 20 feet high and half a foot thick. Still needs work, he muttered to himself, before turning and looking at her, and it was then she noted a few changes that he had gone through since she last saw him. He was wearing something akin to an armored pauldron on one of his shoulders, but, shaped like some odd face, was it some form of animal. But what stood out more, was that his eyes, a light brown were now a bright crimson red. He blinked, looking at her oddly, before grinning, newly crimson eyes looking her up and down. Look who finally took my advice, he noted, no idea how you grew your hair out so quickly, but you are looking real good now Hanada. definitely working that 9 out of 10, he voiced appreciatively. It took considerable effort on her part, to stop her cheeks from burning red and ducking away from his gaze. Thank you, Hanada replied, before giving a small cough. Uh, Daiki-kun, can I ask what happened to your eyes? Oh these? He jerked a thumb up to point at his eyes, nothing much, got into a fight with some missing ninja the other day, one of them had these, a pretty sweet dujutsu, so when I killed them, 
I took the eyes myself and implanted them using my mystical palm jutsu. Hinata stared. She wasn't sure how she should process that. It was very morbid and horrifying to a degree that he would just replace his eyes with a dead mons. But at the same time, she had to admire the sheer pragmatism and decisiveness that would be needed for such an action. It did hit a little close to home though, what with the reason why the branch family of the Hyuga had to be given the caged bird seal. She decided to put it out of mind. Are you busy Daiki-kun? She asked, moving on. I was hoping to do some training with you. I'm fine with it, you're the perfect person to test these new eyes of mine out with anyway. Daiki grinned and readily accepted, though, don't go thinking that just because you're a total solid 9 now, that'll go easy on you. She didn't expect him to, she knew well enough, that was not what he was about, but still, his words did make her chest warm with pride and a smile quirk up over her lips. What if I was a 10? Hinata challenged, activating her Byakugan, feeling her heart flutter as she did, and unzipping her new lavender and white jacket, exposing her torso underneath and wrapped it around her waist. Daiki had paid very special attention to her backside and her chest since he started helping her, and so had she. She'd changed up her mesh armor for a slightly more sheer and breathable version, which would have left her breasts very much bare and easy to see through the mesh links, if not for the small black half corset she'd added as well. It hid her large breasts, yet at the same time pushed up her cleavage quite abundantly. Daiki just stared at her for a moment, before grinning, eyes feasting on her cleavage and giving her a wolf whistle. Well now you're just making me jealous of Naruto, he shamelessly admitted. Her smile spread so wide across her cheeks it almost hurt. In spite of the happiness his words inspired in Hinata, she decided to move first, knowing that she was the one at the disadvantage. Hinata dashed forward towards the boy, thrusting a palm out towards his lower left stomach with her right hand, she expected him to block with his outer forearm, catching her in the junction to leave her wide open for a counter and planned for it. But the taller boy stepped back a single step, easily avoiding her, but didn't counter himself. That was fine. She followed through, swinging her left palm out aiming for his right shoulder. But his arm shot out, catching her wrist and stopping her in its tracks, before she even fully committed. What? Hinata's eyes widened. Thinking quickly, she lashed out with a sweep at his legs, he jumped as expected, but did not let go of her arm as she wanted in the process. With her free hand, while he was in the air, she quickly took advantage to lash out at his stomach. Or, that was what she attempted at least. Just as her muscles tensed, his knee shot out and caught her in the cheek, letting go of her hand at the same time. Pain flared in her cheek and the force of the blow sent Hinata blasting backwards. She grinded her feet across the ground, bleeding off the momentum and rubbed her cheek. Daiki didn't pursue her, instead as he landed, he was grinning at her, wiggling his eyebrows as if to tell her, come at me. That, Something was off about how he countered her there. Daiki was fast for sure, but that wasn't just speed. Ignoring the pain in her cheek, Hinata spread one leg back behind her, before pushing off of it and launching back towards Daiki. This time, she went for a full-out offense. She wasn't even close to mastering the 8 trigrams 64 palms, but individual tenketsu were well within her ability to close one by one. Chakras surging from two fingertips atop each hand, Hinata launched into a flurry of blows, aiming for his lower body, with his more muscular build, it was the hardest place for him to defend. Yet, with each strike, speeding, blurring strikes she could barely keep track of herself, she came up short. Daiki backpedaled, dodged and deflected each and every strike, the most she managed, was a few glancing blows that never even came close to his tenketsu. This, Hinata didn't know what to think, but, she wasn't about to give up, she just had to. Daiki caught her wrist on her next strike, apparently he was done just avoiding her blows. She tried to break his grip and jump back, but he was much too strong for that and instead, with a jerk of his own wrist, pulled her bodily through the air towards him, a rising knee aiming for her stomach. Two options flared instantly in her mind, defend or attack. She attacked, she thrust out with her other hand, meeting the knee, two fingers hitting the tenketsu in his knee. She heard bone crunch. Agony flared through her fingers as the knee continued on, breaking her fingers on impact, before gagging as it slammed into her stomach. Hinata was launched backwards through the air and slammed into a large tree. The blow winded her twice over, making it hard to breath, and the tree snapped from how hard she slammed into it and tumbled to the ground. For a second, she lay there against the snapped tree trunk, slumped over it in a daze, trying to regain her ability to breath. 
She shook herself from it quickly, ignoring the pain in her fingers and stomach. Hanada jabbed the pressure points over her airways, opening them up and allowing her to suck in more breath. She gasped in great big lungfuls of air and looked blearily at Daiki. He was rubbing at his knee where she cut off the flow of his chakra and eyeing it with interest. The way he was staring at his knee though, it was almost as if. So that's how the gentle fist works, I see. Daiki's eyes widened in some apparent realization, and her eyes widened as a rushing, salmon-colored chakra seemed to rush from a point in his chest, spreading through his body briefly before disappearing entirely almost as if it was never there. And suddenly, his chakra was flowing through the tenketsu on his knee once again. What? What was going on? Hinata had never heard of anything like that before, and the only way she knew for a tenketsu to be unlocked, was if another practitioner of the gentle fist undone the block, or wait for the block to fade away naturally. Can, can you see the tenketsu? Hinata couldn't help but gasp out, even as she tried to get her breathing back under control. Pretty much yeah, Daiki directed his grin at her, these eyes can do a lot of things, some of that includes everything those pretty little eyes of yours can. Well except that that 360 degree vision. His eyes, they were like the Bayakugan. These eyes can do a lot of things, some of that includes. Hinata's eyes widened, a light bulb of realization occurring for her as well. You are predicting my attacks as well. She'd sparred with Daiki a few times. She knew he was incredibly fast and incredibly strong, but it was different today. If it was someone who wasn't used to fighting him, they would probably miss it entirely, but not her. That too, a bit like the Sharingan actually, the only thing these eyes don't do in that aspect is slow down my perception and let me auto-copy shit. He revealed with a shrug, before a massive smirk spread across his face, honestly, I've never heard of a dujutsu like this before, so I was thinking, maybe these eyes are a result of an Uchiha and one of your clanmates getting it on. That, Hinata trailed off, she wasn't sure if that would have those kind of results. But then, she'd seen the family records and never seen an Uchiha that married into the family before, so she couldn't actually say anything on that part. She shook her head and pushed herself up off of the tree, her stomach protested the action, but she ignored it. None of this actually mattered right now while they were sparring. Taking advantage of his distraction, Hinata kicked off the tree and lunged at Daiki as far as she could, a palm strike aimed at his shoulder. As she expected, he easily avoided the blow and let her shoot right past him. Pushing Chakra out of her feet, she stuck herself to the ground before pushing off, spinning around entirely and lashing out with a spinning kick, while she quickly reached for her equipment pouch with her other hand, ignoring the pain from her broken fingers and snatching a smoke bomb out. Daiki caught her kick in his palm, gripping tightly around her ankle and a split second later, Hinata was bodily picked up and her vision blurred as Daiki spun around with her in his grip. It was astounding how strong he was, that he could so easily just grab her and toss her around with one hand as if she weighed little more than a feather. It was a good thing, she expected this. She flicked her hand, smashing the smoke bomb beneath them, a thick cloud of smoke bursting up around them and then she was airborne as Daiki let go, tossing her. Then, she once again ignored the pain in her fingers to quickly make the hand seals for the replacement jutsu, a log taking her place, soaring through the air and she shifted her gaze, before bursting back towards the smoke cloud with Daiki inside. This should cut off his his prediction ability a bit I hope, she thought. Few people knew, that, the Bayakugan could be selective in what it saw through. It could be used to see through practically anything, but could be used to not see through everything at the same time. If they couldn't do that after all, when used, the sensory output they had, would be very confusing, they wouldn't be able to even see themselves standing on solid ground. So if his new eyes were like the Bayakugan, he would have to actively shift his vision type to see her. He would actively have to either see through the smoke itself, or see her chakra to catch sight of her. It was a small, tiny weakness, but a weakness nonetheless. Underscore, an hour later, Hinata found herself slumped down, leaning forward. She was soaked right through with sweat and her body felt like one massive bruise. She was utterly exhausted and could barely move a muscle. You done much better today, Daiki praised her, stretching out his arms in front of her, despite his praise, and his clothing being ruffled a bit and ripped in some parts, he looked completely fine and not exhausted at all, and that's saying a lot considering how much stronger I've got since we last sparred and my new upgrades. She managed a faint smile at his praise, it's thanks to you, Hinata admitted, I wouldn't have improved this much if you didn't help me out before. She was ever so grateful he had taken the time to do so, 
She was, almost astounded at her own progress. She actually managed to land a few hits on him, even with his new eyes. And since then, she'd won much more spars against Kiba and Shino, and her losses to them were getting more rare as the days went on. You've not improved that much, Daiki shook his head, refuting her words. You've always been this skilled more or less. No, I've not, Hinata refuted back, frowning lightly, that didn't make sense, I wouldn't be doing this much better if I was. It's not that, Daiki cut her off and sat down beside her, you're getting better no doubt about it babe, but you've never been weak like you think you were. You're just applying what you've got better now that you have the confidence to do so. What do you mean, Hinata's brows furrowed, that, didn't seem like it would make that big a difference. Daiki shrugged, honestly, it's like, no amount of training will make you strong if you don't believe you can be strong, you need to believe you can actually do it, you just set yourself up for failure by letting your own doubts weigh you down, he explained, before waving his hand at her, it's like your new look. My look, Hinata tilted her head, she was beginning to get a general gist of what he meant there, before he suddenly changed topics. Yeah, like, despite how hot you are, you were hiding away and shy about yourself, didn't believe in your own looks, he continued. Then his eyes raked over her body and she found herself almost instinctively pressing her chest out. See, like that. Now that you know how absurdly attractive you are and how dynamite your body is, you're not shying away and stepping right in. It's the same in a fight, if you don't believe in your ability to win, you shy away, flinch more, give up without giving your all. Because you're not doing that anymore, you feel like you've grown massively, when really you've been strong all along. So it was like that, it was the exact same. She hadn't gotten more beautiful, she was just not hiding anymore because she didn't feel the need to now that she knew. So in the end, it really did all just come down to believing in herself and her worth. She felt suddenly, as if a weight was lifting from her shoulders that she hadn't realized had been there. Despite her progress, she'd regretted it, how much time she'd wasted being weak. But as it turned out, she'd never wasted her time at all. Her efforts actually meant something in the end. Anyway, enough about that, Daiki said before suddenly grasping her by the shoulders and bodily turning her around, a yelp of surprise leaving her throat from the bold move. Let me fix you up a bit, especially those fingers. The boy reached out and gently grasped her hand, before lifting it up and making a single hand seal, green chakra flaring to life around his hands and being directed into her hand, focused around her fingers. It was warm, and the pain began to numb away almost instantly. It was funny in a way, that someone like Daiki, who was so headstrong and bold, knew something as delicate as medical ninjutsu. She then noticed where his eyes were directed and a small smile spread across her lips in amusement, her cheeks warming ever so slightly. Did, you need to turn me around like this? Hanata asked, she was curious if he would try to hide it. Nope, he shrugged, not looking away from her chest, I just wanted to have a look at your cleavage, none of the other girls in our class come close to having tits like these. Might not be for me in the end, but I can admire my own handiwork, right? As always, he was so very upfront. I don't mind, Hinata admitted, and she didn't at all. She actually quite liked his attention. Shallow it might have been, but Daiki was a strong, handsome boy himself. Hinata sure had changed. A lot. Daiki watched the older girl leave, and he had to admit it, she was rocking the confidence in her new outfit. She had all the energy of that alter Hinata from the road to ninja without the raging bitch to go along with it. She wasn't his match at all during their spar, but she just kept on coming no matter the punishment he gave her, and the way she seemed to not flaunt her body or even relish in the attention but accepted his ogling with a confidence he'd never seen in her. No doubt about it. Hinata was hot as fuck. He'd actually had to resist grabbing a few gropes here or there, or outright looking through her clothes with his eyes. I'm surprised, I have to admit, with how greedy you are. I thought you'd jump on the chance to take the girl and fulfill your desires, Isogu mused. The girl was clearly receptive to your leering. He had noticed that as well actually. She'd full on stuck her breasts out more for him to look at when she noticed he was staring, and didn't shy away from him leering at her tits while he was healing her. That's just because I'm the one that fueled her confidence in the first place, Daiki shrugged. He had a feeling, if he pushed with her, Hinata would let him play with her, but he wasn't going to. A cunt he may be, but he and Hinata were more or less friends. He wasn't going to take advantage of her leaning on him like that, it would be a complete scum move. She was in love with another guy anyway, grating as it was that he'd accomplished more than he thought with Hinata on making her actually have worth as a partner to support Naruto and found himself desiring her himself. 
Mission failed successfully? Besides, as much as I would love to rail her till she has hearts in her eyes, my place is a shithole. Daiki pointed out. He wouldn't be bringing any girls back to his place until he got a better place. And that wasn't even going into all his other issues that would make him horrible boyfriend material right now. He wondered idly how much it would cost to get him a compound of his own. Maybe not one suited for an entire clan or something, but one with a big living space and general property area where he could train if he wanted. What about one with a nice big pond? Isobu suggested. Like for COI fish? Daiki asked. I suppose, but more for me, the turtle Biju replied. Hate to break it to you, but you're a bit too big to fit a pond buddy. Daiki snorted at the mental image, imagining the leviathan of a turtle dipping one of his feet in a pond and barely covering a toe. Not like that you fool, I so be huffed. I can form miniature clones of myself, remember? If you can form a summoning contract, I can link it to myself and you can use the contract to summon a clone of me. Huh, that could work. He vaguely remembered Naruto getting stuck inside Isobu's stomach once and a horde of mini Isobu's trying to eat him alive. That would be a useful jutsu for dealing with multiple enemies. Hmm, summoning. Isobu horde devourer. That would be a badass name for it as well. I just want to relax in some proper water when I can, but sure, feel free to weaponize my leisure idea, Isobu sighed. You really do have a one-track mind. Earlier you were thinking about how you could create a seal that would have your clothes strangle someone for you in case they pinned you. Gotta keep up the grind set buddy, was Daiki's only excuse. Speaking of the grind set, a rush of memories flooded his mind. One of his clones just popped. It was one of the ones working on water elemental manipulation. It looked like it was spreading what it learned so far to the other clones. He had 21 clones in total grinding away in Isobu's dimension. 10 working on the water jutsu that Isobu told him of through Yaguras and holy fuck was there a lot, and that wasn't even going into the jutsu of other elements the dude knew. And another 10 working on the basics of water elemental manipulation, which started off from draining moisture from physical items that retained water, like leaves. The one left over was the main clone he made, to replace clones that popped themselves and be refilled on chakra by Isobu. Once his chakra capacity grew, he'd be able to make even more and steadily increase the amount of clones he could use for his training. Hmm. Yeah, he should totally work on that summoning scroll. Isobro was such a big help to him, he needed to show his gratitude. Please don't call me that. Isobu groaned, he sounded in pain. He was about to respond, but just then, a familiar dark-haired teen walked into his training ground, though the Uchiha was looking over his shoulder oddly. I'm popular today. Daiki snorted. Hey, Sasuke greeted him, what's with the Hyuga that just came from here? I hope a new girlfriend isn't gonna slow your training down, kicking you around is good for my progress. Daiki raised an eyebrow, you've never kicked me around before, even back in the academy you weren't that much better than me, he shot back, and what do you mean, it's Hinata. Sasuke gave him a blank look, who the hell is Hinata? He asked, completely lost. What? You know, the Hyuga heiress, was in our class for 8 years. Daiki reminded. Doesn't ring a bell. Sasuke shook his head, this guy. She's on a team with Shino and Kiba, she stalked Naruto all the time, Daiki added. Sasuke blinked, before his eyes widened, wait, her. He gaped, what the heck happened? She smiled at me and everything, I remember that girl like hiding away when I met her eyes a few times. Daiki smirked, crossing his arms, some of my awesome rubbed off on her, he replied. Ew, gross, wasn't she like Naruto's fangirl or something? She was a quiet one at least, if only the ones that followed me around were that quiet, Sasuke wrinkled his nose, shaking his head. Well, if you're fine with a fangirl, how about Sakura, and Yamanaka? I give you my blessing to rub all over them, granted, no idea why you'd want to, but have it it. They really bother you huh? Daiki couldn't help but laugh, the boy always complained about them to him. I make no attempts hide that. I told them straight up, but they still won't leave me alone, Sasuke shrugged. Also, what the hell is up with your eyes? Dujutsu, Daiki shrugged. Ran into a missing ninja on my last mission. His eyes were pretty damn powerful, so when I killed them I implanted them. Sasuke raised an eyebrow. You trying to be Kakashi or something? He asked, but otherwise barely reacted. Not really, but they were just gonna go to waste, Daiki shrugged. It's just like taking weapons from their corpses as well. Sasuke snorted, you don't need to make excuses to me, he shrugged himself, 
you didn't have a dojutsu, now you do. Do you know how many people in the past wars tried to kill members of my clan for their eyes? I'll tell you, a lot. It's just common sense, I do it as well if I didn't have the sharingan, the best dojutsu by the way. He smirked and flashed his sharingan on. See, this was why he was actually beginning to like Sasuke, the guy understood the grind. You think so? Daiki grinned challengingly and narrowed his eyes, focusing his chakra through his eyes. The air shimmered, and a clone appeared right next to Sasuke. It lets you make clones, weird. The Uchiha noted, before swinging his hand out to hit the clone and no doubt dispel it. Only his hand went right through it as if it were a mirage. What the hell, Sasuke blinked, confused and stared as the clone faded away before looking back at Daiki, what was up with that? That was an illusion, but I couldn't see through it and I could see a chakra network that looked identical to yours in it. Chakra ghost, Daiki's grin turned smug, even the Sharingan and Byakugan can't tell them apart from the real thing according to the last user. Just one of the many abilities these eyes have. Sasuke's smirk returned, but was full of excitement now, alright, that's a pretty neat trick, I'll admit, he admitted, what else you got? He challenged, sliding into the opening stance of the Uchiha Interceptor style. Oh a ton of shit and one specifically I want to test against you actually, Daiki retorted, he had been wondering if masking his chakra network would make the Sharingan unable to copy his jutsu after all, but I'm gonna have to pass on using you as a punching bag today buddy. Sasuke eased out of his stance and raised an eyebrow at him, odd of you, you never turned down the chance to fight, he pointed out, unless you have another mission that is? Nah, Daiki waved him off, nothing like that, I've just come into a bit of money lately from missions and bounties of cash den. And, Sasuke prompted, other eyebrow joining the first, I'm thinking of checking out some houses, get a nice place for myself, Daiki shrugged back. My place is a shithole apartment I got given as a kid once I joined the academy and left the orphanage, I'm thinking it's about time I upgrade. Makes sense I suppose, well about as much as anything you do does, Sasuke nodded, giving a blatant odd look at the isogu pauldron on his shoulder, what kind of place are you looking for? A pretty decently sized one I'm thinking, Daiki mused, crossing his arms, a bit like the main house of your clan compound, one with enough space I can train it and a pond is a definite as well. Maybe some place where it isn't too busy, I like my privacy after all. Oh, is all that? Sasuke gave him a deadpan look, sure you don't want a waterfall out back in your own collection of maids while you're at it? You're the one that asked dipshit, Daiki snorted, I'll make my own waterfall if I want one and maybe if you're lucky, I'll convince Sakura and Ino to be my maids to save you from them. If only, Sasuke snorted back, so going by your words, you're learning water and earth ninjutsu as well now. Water jutsu yeah, as far as earth goes though, Daiki responded and slowly ran through a set of hand seals, ten in total, before crouching and slamming them on the ground, earth style. Barrier. In front of him, a large 20 foot tall wall of earth shot up from the ground and about a foot or so wide. Then he punched it and watched it shattered apart, raising an eyebrow at Sasuke when the debris rained apart and showed him on the other side. I mean, it's not a bad jutsu really, Sasuke pointed out. It's not gonna stop any really strong jutsu, but not bad. You're just absurdly physically strong with stupidly big muscles. Jealous, Daiki taunted. Not especially, Sasuke shrugged, bulking up like you will only harm the way I fight. I mean it clearly works for you, but I'd have to rework my fighting style if I ever went for a build like yours. Fair enough, Daiki nodded, he got that, and the guy was definitely right. His style relied on being pretty damn limber, as far as this jutsu goes. You could probably learn it yourself pretty easily, in an hour at most. It's not a great barrier but has its uses like you said, doesn't take much chakra either, the only problem with it, is despite how low tier it is, it needs 10 hand seals. Honestly, he just remembered the shinobi alliance all learning it in like a few minutes to try and help ward of the jubis bijudama and decided to try it out himself. Took him a half hour which went to show how easy the jutsu was, since he had no instruction on it and only knew what the final product looked like in the hand seals. That's so, maybe I'll try it out later then, Sasuke nodded, before smirking as a thought apparently occurred to him, maybe I'll teach Naruto it and have him spam it with his stupid clones, that idiot could use a little variety and ability to provide some support. He has the chakra for it, so a good idea, Daiki nodded, though, I honestly don't get your sensei. He should teach Naruto a fire jutsu and a wind jutsu, give the kid them and with his clones, 
he'd be able to wipe out bandits in the hundreds in just a few seconds. Ah, like the combination I accidentally used with that foo girl back in Waterfall, Sasuke noted, before shrugging, I don't get the guy either. Zabuza boasted about him knowing over a thousand jutsu, be nice if he could toss some of that our way. He mostly just makes us spar against each other, against him or do these stupid team exercises that yeah, is useful for fighting in a squad, but is utterly useless for what I actually want to do. Probably the basics I guess, jutsu won't mean shit if you can't keep up with your opponent, like that shithead back in waterfall showed us, Daiki mused, still, he could definitely be doing more. It isn't as bad for you since you have your clan teachings and probably at least a few jutsu scrolls kicking around and in the future you'll be easy to copy a ton, but Naruto and Sakura are getting fucked over in the long run that way. Kakashi sucks and a genin has a better idea on how to train his team, nothing I haven't thought before, Sasuke snorted, but putting how unreliable Kakashi is out of mind for the moment, as far as your little house touring idea goes, I've got a place like that I wouldn't mind selling you. You do? Daiki gave him a confused look, isn't that like your clan property though? And I have no clan residing there, Sasuke pointed out, I was thinking of selling some of the outer properties anyway. A bunch of annoyances on that civilian council that handles the business sectors and stuff of the village have been hounding me for a while about it, one in particularly wanted this property I'm thinking of. I'd rather sell it to you than have him live anywhere near me. So spite then? A wide grin spread across Daiki's face, I can totally get behind that. I figured, Sasuke smirked back, alright, come on then, I'll show you the place. He wasn't at all expecting the place Sasuke showed him. For one, it was way bigger than he thought it was going to be. It looked for all intents and purposes like a Japanese style mansion, all sliding doors and everything. And it was he repeated, big. The place had three bathrooms, multiple in-house storage rooms, a large living room and kitchen, a dining room and eight bedrooms, one of them being a much larger master bedroom. That was only the main house itself. On top of that, as requested, the place had a large koi pond, and he did mean large, it was at the front of the house, on both sides of the path leading towards the main house, the path built right over it. There were multiple gardens that while untamed now, were most likely used for growing fruit and vegetables, and to top it all off, at the back of the property, there was a large spread out yard, big enough to contain a large storage shed and moderate-sized training dojo and still have plenty of space left over for him to train. The place was run down for sure, because nobody had lived in it for years, but it was still connected to the electrical grids and stuff apparently, he'd just need to get them turned back on. So, what do you think? Sasuke asked once they were done. They were currently sitting on the back porch, overlooking the backyard, want it? Yeah I want it, Daiki looked at the boy as if he were crazy. Who wouldn't want this place? No way I can afford it though, this place is amazing. Way fucking better than his shitty little apartment. I'll give it you to cheap, Sasuke shrugged in response. It's not perfect or anything and needs works done on it, so isn't worth as much as it used to be, and if you don't have enough, I'll let you pay it in installments over time. That could work. Sending a clone out every day when he was training to do AD rank was already pulling him in a nice tidy sum. He could just do multiple he supposed and there were always missing ninja out and about somewhere to hunt down. All right, that works out well enough for me, Daiki agreed, how much you want for it? Sasuke shrugged again, like I said, pretty cheap, I'll give you it for 10 million. Daiki's mouth dropped, that's it, he gaped. Sasuke smirked at his shock, I told you, cheap, he pointed out, besides, the Uchiha land in general has went down quite a bit in value over the last few years with nobody to take care of the place and you know, being pretty far from the interior of the village on top of what happened to my clan, civilians are a superstitious bunch, they think ghosts and demons or something are going to haunt them. A frown spread across his face as he finished explaining the reason why he was selling it so cheap. Daiki winced, the air becoming a bit melancholy around them, actually, demons and ghosts are a real thing. He pointed out, changing the subject. Sasuke gave him an odd look, before huffing and rolling his eyes, bullshit the older boy retorted. No, I'm not kidding, Daiki shook his head and laughed, hell is a literal real place, there's even a summoning clan that came from hell once, they got sealed in a bunch of doors though. Have you been doing drugs? Sasuke asked incredulously. Demons, sealed into doors? Do you hear how stupid you sound? Hey man, Hashirama Senju could summon them, hell he used them against your ancestor Madara from what I hear, Daiki shot back, 
Actually, I even know where some kind of demon fucker is right now, calls itself Kakaboshi, it's not actually far from the village actually. He'd actually confirmed the place it appeared in was a real place. The thing was pretty damn strong considering it took a Shippuden three-tailed cloak Naruto to beat it. He'd had the idle idea since Isogu told him about the origins of the Rishaman, about going after it and forcing it to become his subordinate. Sasuke was still giving him a disbelieving look, I'll believe it when I see it, he snorted, so you want the house then? He asked, moving on. Yeah, I'll take it. Daiki put the topic on the shelf for now and agreed. Actually, this is a pretty big place, who did it belong to before? It would have to be someone at least semi-important, right? A cousin of mine, Sasuke shrugged. His name was Shisui, this is where his family has lived for decades before. Wait, this place was fucking Shisui's house? As in Shisui of the Shunshin? Daiki wanted to confirm. You know him? Sasuke blinked, surprised. Only by reputation, Daiki explained quickly. Dude was a badass. He made the Shunshin actually full on viable in combat and mastered it so well he could use it on the fly with no hand seals. I heard people compare him to the Yandaimi Hokage a few times. Sasuke's lips quirked up, he was a pretty cool guy, he agreed lightly. Daiki agreed. Shisui was such a fucking badass, and his Suzano was so fucking epic, the green coloring of it was so nice and it had a full on drill arm. Too bad that cunt Danzo had to fuck everyone over. If he didn't, the village would have the full Uchiha clan still, alongside Itachi and Shisui, both who would no doubt be powerful S-class shinobi by this time. Then he wouldn't need to worry about the Akatsuki as much. He would have a freaking Itachi on his side after all. Fucking Danzo, he was why Konoha couldn't have nice things man. Daiki frowned, looking at Sasuke. Should he? He couldn't tell him all he knew of course, but, he had an excuse and he could give Sasuke some information in regards to what Itachi had been up to using Isobu as an excuse. And also put him on guard against Obito. The dude was being a pretty good friend to him right now. And he was suddenly feeling a little guilty about the knowledge he had that pertained to the other boy. Daiki pushed Chakra into his eyes, enhancing his vision and allowing him to see Chakra and through any obstacle. Then turned his idly from side to side. The only people that could hide from these eyes, were people with these eyes. Not even Zetsu would be able to hide from him. Trick him? Most likely yes considering he could perfectly mimic the looks and chakra of another. But hide from him? Not a chance. Nobody. Daiki noted. The closest people were over a thousand feet away. There weren't even any Anbu watching him or Sasuke. Why are your eyes glowing? Sasuke asked. Just checking to make sure nobody is spying on us. These eyes of mine can do basically everything the Byakugan can except the 360 vision. Daiki explained idly, before drawing the chakra from his eyes and focusing on Sasuke, nobody around but us. You expected there to be? The other boy asked, raising an eyebrow. Can never be too careful, Daiki responded. What do you think? He asked internally. I'll leave it up to you, Isobu responded simply. He nodded, actually, on the topic of your family, Daiki began, on my last mission. Thanks to some things that went down, I've come across some information about your brother since he left the village. Sasuke's eyes abruptly widened in shock, before quickly narrowing, tell me, he demanded, no nonsense. Usually, Daiki would probably make a quip about him being rude, but, he understood, this wasn't quite the right moment. Even just some passing information about Itachi, was incredibly important to Sasuke, his brother was the guy's main driving force in life right now. What do you know about Jinchiriki? Daiki asked. Sasuke frowned, brows furrowing in deep thought. Power of the human sacrifice. He said, is that some kind of suicide jutsu? Or some kind of power from killing people? Not quite, Daiki shook his head. Do you remember the Kayubi? Considering how often it gets brought up, no, he huffed, impatiently. What about it? What does the Kayubi have to do with this? I'm getting to it. You need context to understand, dude. Daiki rolled his eyes. The Kayubi is what's known as a biju, nine of them in total. Each with a specific amount of tails from one to nine, the Kayubi being the strongest of them. And, Sasuke prompted. Biju can't die, it's as simple as that, when they're killed, they just reform, Daiki dropped, they have to be sealed away, but not anything can work for that. It needs to be people to hold them for any length of time, these people are called Jinchiriki. And bringing this up in regards to Itachi means he's got something to do with these Jinchiriki or wants them for something, Sasuke caught on pretty quick. 
Quite, Daiki nodded, the thing about Jinchuriki, is that they can usually use the power of the biju sealed in them. Granted, that's simplifying it a lot and it comes with a lot of risks. But, being the Jinchuriki comes with a bunch of benefits, like massive chakra reserves, incredible endurance, a natural healing factor and depending on the biju, special almost kekai jenke like abilities. I see, Sasuke responded and fell silent for a moment, before, so I take it then, that Itachi is hunting these Jinchuriki for some reason, going from what you told me, for the power being one gives? That, I'm not sure on, I just know he attacked a Jinchuriki and has joined a group that's all about that. Daiki replied, he did know what the real goal was, but he had no way of explanation as to why, so he kept mum on the subject, what I do know, is that the former Mizukage was a Jinchuriki. A near perfect Jinchuriki capable of using almost all of the power of his biju and your brother alongside the guy that Zabuza Momochi replaced in the Seven Ninja Swordsmen of the Mist, attacked him to steal his biju a few months after he went rogue. Sasuke's eyes widened massively, the Mizukage, he sputtered. He didn't win, Daiki quickly assured him, his partner even got killed in the process, which is why he was replaced when his sword was reclaimed. But your brother managed to escape and injured the Mizukage in the process. The thing is he apparently shot some crazy black flames from his eyes. His Sharingan was different as well from yours. It had some crazy shuriken-like pattern in them. Mangeku Sharingan, Sasuke hissed. Yeah, that's what he called it, Daiki confirmed. The fire was called Amaterasu by the way. The injuries he caused to the Mizukage, was what made him lose against the rebellion against him like a year later and he died. Sasuke clicked his tongue, so that guy Zabuza failed to kill, died because of Itachi? Kind of, Daiki nodded, that's not the only thing though. You know how there was a rebellion for years in the mist and everyone hated the Mizukage? Sasuke shrugged, Zabuza said something about it when he was bragging to Kakashi, he replied. Yeah, see, the Mizukage was a pretty nice guy apparently, Daiki revealed, until suddenly he wasn't. The thing is, his personality changed overnight, and I found out just recently as well, that it was because he was being controlled by a man with the Sharingan who claimed to be Madara Uchiha. Absurd, Sasuke shook his head, Madara is long dead, he was killed by Hashirama Senju over 50 years ago. It's mostly likely a pretender, Daiki agreed, but he does have the Sharingan as well, so unless he stole it from someone, he's most likely an Uchiha as well, especially since he and Itachi seem to know each other. Another traitor then? Sasuke growled, before shaking his head, alright, this is a lot to take in. Do you have any proof about it? I heard it from the horse's mouth himself, or rather, the turtle. Daiki smirked, pointing at the isobu shaped pauldron on his shoulder. What? Sasuke blinked. I can't really get into the full thing, Daiki replied, but you know how I'm pretty damn good with seals. Vividly, my stomach especially remembers after you used that force palm jutsu of yours on me the first time, Sasuke remarked dryly. Well, I've been getting better and better lately, Daiki nodded, and during my last mission, I came across a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, or well a former one, like Zabuza that you guys fought. Him, and a bunch of other crazy traitor ninja from the village of artisans teamed up together, because the biju inside the Mizukage, reformed in a lake in the land of rivers. Sasuke said nothing, just digesting the words, he was letting Daiki continue obviously before saying anything. They planned to well, Use the sandbi to make a bunch of super weapons and then attack the leaf with it, Daiki revealed. They planned it out a lot. With special eyes that could hypnotize the biju and special armor and weapons that could drain its chakra and weaken it, so they could seal it or rather him, themselves. I see, your eyes. Sasuke realized. Daiki smirked, yep, he confirmed, basically, even with all their preparations, they were weak and exhausted, so I jumped in myself, sealed the biju inside myself broke it from the hypnosis and teamed up with it to kill them all. Sasuke went totally quiet and just stared at Daiki. For a full-on minute, he said nothing, and just seemed to digest everything he was told. So you're one of these Jinchuriki then and you can talk with this Sanbi that you sealed in yourself? He asked. Daiki simply nodded. So the Sanbi itself told you about Itachi then, and if it was inside the Mizukage, it would know all about the guy controlling him as well. Sasuke grimaced, before his eyes widened in what looked like panic, meaning, Itachi is out there right now hunting these other Jinchuriki, could have captured one or more already and gotten the power of these biju to himself. He's not, Daiki was quick to assure him, if the other Jinchuriki disappeared, it would be big news like the Mizukage. Sasuke froze, how do you know, 
he asked, pressing. Because Jinchuriki are spread around the main villages, generally used to deter wars. Daiki explained, Sand has the one tail. Mist had the three tails and the six tails. Stone has the four and five tails. Cloud has the two and eight tails. Waterfall has the seven tails and Konoha has the nine tails. And now the three tails with me. Oh, Sasuke swallowed, this, this is really big then isn't it? Pretty much, Daiki nodded, if a Jinchuriki goes missing, their village will start pointing fingers and it might just lead to the fourth great shinobi world war. Sasuke clenched his fists, that bastard, it wasn't enough to murder our clan, but now this, he shook with rage. Daiki didn't comment and just let the boy sort himself out. A deep shuddering breath left the Uchiha and he stood up, I need some time to think, Sasuke said, giving him a tight nod, I'll get the money from you for this place later, but for now, I need to go. It's a lot to take in, yeah. Daiki agreed, bidding him goodbye with a small wave. Once Sasuke left the place behind, Daiki looked around himself and nodded. Guess I can start moving in and getting this place fixed up. He mused. Thank fuck for shadow clones. 